I feel I've just been seeing so much and reading. Well, I read about the, the virus itself. So, you know, Carrie, we were doing. <laughs> they got bleach wipes in there. That's right. We made some alcohol water. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's funny. I um. It's funny you didn't wipe your side down yesterday. I no, was I in here not. earlier. I was wiping my stuff down. I had I bleach wiped, then sprayed, then sprayed the whole room with Lysol, then sprayed some fan. I Lysol in the fan to make sure it circulated. Um, but check this out. So did you see that the COVID ID lasts three hours in the air, four hours on copper surfaces? 24 hours on cardboard and two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. Man, that's a tough bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Who would think stainless steel? I All right, right, like right. I mean, maybe it just it just so maybe it can live on its own. Well, clearly it could live on its own for three days, yeah. and on the stat on the stat on the place where it's nowhere it's not porous. Right. Shut it in What's up, y'all? And I don't want to bore you with it. Look, Todd, look, Todd done, now he done got with the program. Yesterday he was breathing up. Carrie was like, is he breathing on you? <laughs> I don't think we ever get that close. Yes, that's not six feet. No, that's not six feet. <laughs> she was like, you was coughing in your sleep. That don't work no more. Now you got to contain it. Like make my makes my mic cover make a lot more sense now, doesn't it? <laughs> Breathing in all them toxins. Well, I got bad uh, sciences or something. I'm I'm congested year round. Oh wow! Kind of sucks, but eh. after a while you get used to it. I can think of much worse things. Let me tell you. And I don't want to bull. I had to, to uh, remind my sister yesterday that she should not be like having, she's in Florida, and you, you can't afford to have people come over and visit you. You've got respiratory issues. It's not, this could be uh, fatal. Fatal for you, yeah. Like, That's I mean, I was trying to explain to people who have asthma. So I want to talk about it because, I mean, to me, it's like that goes back to my point of the other day, right? Where I was like, yo, and it's like, what, I don't, like, if I decide that I'm taking it seriously and you're not taking it seriously, that's fine, but don't infect me, right, now that, right? and it's like, I'm still tripping on that response, right, like, because my wife was like, wait a minute, so if you don't want to get it. Does somebody have because they feel like they're invincible? Right? Like, because in their mind, they can't get it. But, like, I'm thinking about, do if you got, do I spread it? Like, what precautions have you taken? Right? I, I know I came in here and disinfected my whole entire space. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, in preparation for that, but then at the same time, I think I'm going to talk, well, we're going to talk about it at 830. But, like, the offense of... Like social distance offense, and it's like I literally like if you try to put your space or whatever, people literally get attitude. That don't bother me. <laughs> I ran into Otis at the grocery store. I was like, "Hey, <laughs> oh no, I don't have a problem with this." But when I say, "Okay," like I'm just being aware because maybe you forgot. Because I'm telling you, there are things that I forget all the time. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And so it's like, it's not a diss to you. It's just, yo, man, I got a family at the crib. 
I got people at the crib that have right that may right. It, I may never touch it. It may never affect me. Look, ooh, I didn't get the knobs. Yeah, I think that's going to be a good conversation. And I saw madness at the grocery store yesterday. Work yesterday, now it's broken. What? <laughs> the knob? Strange it, world. No, it just needs to be tightened up. It's like, well. well Download the weekend. Then it worked after the weekend. That's because it's got a short. Uh, what needs to happen is somebody needs to get under this table. Yeah. Can I get a rundown? Oh, thank you. You're the best. I cannot see it. Hey, everybody. There's Sonia Escobar. ILL. And we are not going to be kingfishers. No. That got voted down? No. We'll just, like, ain't nobody calling us the damn kingfishers. You want to talk about a rebel? You want to talk about... Even the answer, that's some shit millennials would say. Right? Yes, let's be the kingfishers. Like, are you crazy? I'd rather we just stay the fighting Illini and make it a shortened version of Illinois as compared to the tribe and just be like the fight. You know, like they could, I don't want it to turn into like a pate, like a, a musketeer. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like they could do something with Illinois and make it. I would, yeah. Like not the chief. I mean, he's gone already. Huh? He's been right. Gone At one point, I wanted to be the chief. Oh really? Mhm. Mm I knew a guy who was, was actually the chief. Guy? No, I think there was a black chief. One other black chief. Yeah. And then I became conscious. <laughs> I think it was interesting. I mean, when you're the chief. You get to talk to, to people. Uh. The chief is like the, you didn't get to really, it's still a mascot, so you really don't get to talk. No, you don't get to be I mean, how. I mean, you know, the, the chief talks to people to, to figure out his dance and all that kind of stuff. Wait, we getting checks? How much out of checks? $1,000. When do they come? I guess they're coming pretty soon. And how do you get it? No, we're able to get these. No, I don't know. I don't know the details yet. I just know that they were talking about uh, $1,000 for everybody. All right, we're ready. Right. Hit that door. You're listening to the morning show. Got to spray the door now. <laughs> I'll get my computer too. Rise and shine. Wake up! Wake up! Whoa, Na 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 na. Wake up, Chicago! Wake up, world! This is the WVON Morning Show. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host, Todd Stroger. Todd, how you feeling this morning? Good. 
Oh, and I'm feeling a great, great. I think there were fewer people on the road than the earlier. Oh, yeah, there was a lot fewer people on the road. Yesterday I was driving at about 5 o'clock, and it was like, wait, is this rush hour? This yeah. is like rush minute. <laughs> it was like I was like, shoo! I was like, let me go back around just to make sure <laughs> I could do You know, it's like when you were at Great America, and you go like on senior day, and they had rented out the whole park, and so you could get like on the tidal wave. And then by the time you got off, walked all the way back around, you could get back in the line again. Oh, yeah. That is exactly how I felt yesterday when I was driving. Uh, actually, I was driving to the gro- to the grocery store. And you know what, Todd? I'm going to talk about this because, you know, I, I'm, I'm really starting to take this a lot more seriously. I said I was going to try to make sure that I was providing good, good, solid information so we could be responsible. Carrie got me yesterday. When I got home, she was like, I thought you t- said that you were going to be 100% uh, serious about this and that you were not. You were going to make sure you gave away good information. I was like, babe, what did I do? And she was like, you said it's just like getting a cold. So, today at 7 o'clock. I, said, I hear people say, well, I, I've heard people say it's like it's a flu. Uh, it's But it's worse, and it's more intense, and it lives forever, and it could affect your life and all those good things. So that's why, yeah, you know, after. You know what, so that's why at 7 o'clock today, we are going to have, that. we're going to do things out of order today. Because you know I like to do politics at 7 and then 8 o'clock. Either. But we're going to flip it all around today because the coronavirus has got the world all upside down. So we're going to be talking to Dr. Cheryl Whitaker, who will be talking to us about fact versus fiction on coronavirus and make sure that we all get together. But you know what I forgot to do? What? I forgot to say uh, what's up to the WVON Morning Show team. So let's do this. Let's say what's up. Let's say what's up to Jennifer Thompson in the newsroom. Jennifer, how are you feeling this morning? I'm feeling wonderful, man. Uh, As always, God is still in control. There it is. You know that. And got to say what's up to Miss Sonia Escobar. Sonia, how are you feeling this morning? Uh, well, I, you know, this is the second place I want to be with. It's like y'all are my extended family, but you know, we have, Carrie has made our house like the fortress of solitude. Mm-hmm. So she like, when you walk in the door, like downstairs, mm-hmm. leave it all downstairs. Like, I mean, you know, I was fussing at her the other day because she was spraying the groceries with Lysol. And I was like, are you spraying the groceries with Lysol? Well, I was just like, I could just imagine the taste. And now I just feel like whenever I make the rice, Uh at some point I'm going to taste the Lysol even if it isn't there. Right? Right? Right. However, after I saw the facts on how this coronavirus lives, I was like, okay, leave everything downstairs. We're going to talk about it because you know what? Uh, Well, let's do this. Let's get the soul plane up to 50,000 feet. Uh, and Todd, we got a good show. I'm, I'm pretty excited about today's show. So we are going to talk about social distance offense, right? I was out yesterday, and it was like, it's like various levels of social social distance offense, right? So like yesterday at the grocery store, I was like, people's walking around with masks. There was a time when you might be offended with people walking around with masks. Like, what you trying to say about me? Mm-hmm. It's not really what I'm trying to say about you. It's really what I'm trying to protect for myself. Um, and so how do you cope with social media distancing? Because people do tend to take it offensive, even if you're just trying to protect your health. Shoot. <laughs> I saw a guy uh, at the grocery store, and he had on what I would say is... A hazmat suit. <laughs> Pretty much, he, I mean, he had the, the big filters and uh, he had gloves on. He said, hey, stranger. <laughs> and you're like, who are you in there? Yeah, right, exactly. I was like, who are you? But do you have to be offended by that? I mean, it's like if that's how he feels like he wants to protect himself, let him be. Respect it. Let's talk about it. We're going to talk about that today. All right, plus, you know what, Todd? Again, Dr. Whitaker, I'm seeing that she's going to be coming on several times a week uh, with this. So we'll be talking about that as well. So I, we got to make sure that we are providing the information and make sure that this is all together. All right, Todd, let me do this. So the coronavirus continues. Uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot today at 5 p.m. will take over all forms of media. She will take over on all forms of media um, in which, Todd, uh, she's going to be on the news channels telling us the coronavirus update from the mayors. I, I, what I've decided also I'm going to do, beyond the Chinatown thing, beyond the Chinatown thing. Right, right. 
is I am going I'm going to do my best not to be critical of our leaders in a critical time like this. What I'm going to try to do, still keep my humor, but I'm going to try to navigate this. Now, if there's something that challenges my common sense, I might bring it up and we have to talk it out and maybe we have to work a workaround. But for, but for now, I'm going to do my best. Governor Pritzker, I'm going to do my best to be a positive citizen and help our people through it in the dissemination of good information. Now, you know most of my comedy comes from politics. So I, I don't want this to be a dry show. So we got to figure out that healthy balance. But I do want to make sure that we are doing right by our people and trying to be part of the problem. I mean, part of the solution, not the problem. Yes. Okay, so I am looking forward to talking to Dr. Whitaker uh, over these next few, uh, over the time that we are having this. But I'm going to tell y'all, make sure that we are ready and rocking and rolling and ready to produce the spot. Right? Let's make sure we got something for her so she can always keep people ready. Because I also want to talk about black readiness today. Like, are we ready? Because you know I was thinking about all the revolutionaries. Remember all the revolutionaries that told us, man, these... Let me tell you something. Yesterday I was in the parking lot at Pete's and it had, there was a fight between a security guard and a man with an extended wrench. No like one of them big... Man, but I, I... You know how you always think you got a weapon in your hand? And you feel... That, that was what I learned watching that yesterday. Yeah. He was trying to swing it and once he swung it once, the guy rushed him. He missed... And then he rushed them. But the thing that was happening was the police drove by three times. And all the people was like, why the police? Like, don't stop. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, uh, off of all the, the armchair revolutionaries who say we don't know, need no police, it was a whole bunch of people out there yesterday talking about the police. Are, are black people really ready? Are we ready? Uh, what happens if the uh, Arab corner stores start gouging even further? Remember, for all the armchair revolutionaries who said, we're just, so we're going to talk about our state of readiness. This is Talk Chicago 1690. We'll be back after traffic and the weather. More of the morning show with Mays Jackson coming up on the talk of. So that Dr. Whitaker thing could be really good. It could be really hard. Right? So it's like, if I got. Hey, y'all, take a moment, share the broadcast. Share the broadcast, share the broadcast. Uh, did you see these facts on Corona? Um, I'm sure I have. It's, it's Three hours in the air, four hours on copper services, 24 hours on cardboard, and two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. So every time you get a Amazon delivery, would you like to borrow my spray? Yeah, I would. Okay. <laughs> Ask. Pull. See see how people do you? Now, yesterday he was spray. We're going to talk about social media distancing, and we're going to talk about using somebody else's products in a limited time supply. <laughs> I, I'm not that formal. If I see some shit that you got that's going to help uh, all of us understand it. <laughs> <laughs> she, and, that, and, and that is exactly how people will start to die. <laughs> I'm just telling you now. I was just talking to somebody who was saying that they had a friend who did not have the medical supplies. Are you grabbing my shit again? See, okay, I'm gonna tell you. For you too. Look, so I'm. There is. So I was talking about a friend. Now, if this was food, I couldn't say that kind of stuff. Yeah, but you spray way more than I would have. And it's like I'm rationing. You're rationing my shit out. So let me tell you. This is. This I'm uh, this is me. You go hold on, just let me give you my my thoughts, right? Todd is the type of person that it seems like would pick up my newspaper and read it before I did. And would crack it and bend it and be like, Oh, it was a newspaper. No, right? no, I would be very conscious of uh, putting dog ears and stuff. I, I, would read it. I right, and I would be like, No, don't crack my paper. Don't touch my shit until I say you can touch my shit. It's like I'm generous, I'm share, but don't make assumptions with me. like that's I don't even it's like I don't even let my wife eat my food. I'd be like, I'll buy you a whole nother meal. Right? So, but I think that's another one of these social distancing issues. Like when you have what's community property and what's your own property. So, right? 
I was talking to somebody who said that in a mixed relationship, someone's child came over and realized that their mom didn't have the wipes and the supplies and all of that stuff. And so she just took some and said, I took them to my mom. And it's like, what you mean? You can't really just be taking people's, like, I think in this place, like, I, I do believe if things got tight, that would be a real issue. That would be a real issue because as supplies become limited, people make the assumption that they can, they, they, don't, they don't know your plan for yours or your ration plan, and they just assume that they're going to take it, right? So I think of it like trackpad for iPad. I have seen her maybe once or twice. One thing I do say is, ooh, she's very nice. She's a lady, pretty, and really want to know. Somehow I got to let my feelings show. She's fresh, fresh, exciting. She's so exciting to me. She's fresh, fresh, inviting. Mm -mm -mm. She's so inviting to me, yeah. I've been thinking about the way you walk. Baby, ooh, I like the way you talk. Something I really can't hide. Me must have sent you to be by my side, fresh and lovely. Like a dream come true. I'll do anything to spend the night with you. I'm feeling. Uh, I can't stop it, baby. I'm so real lady. Took me away. She's fresh, fresh, exciting. Mm -mm 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 -mm. She's so exciting to me, yeah. You are tuned in to the Top of Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Nate Jackson. Got my co host, Tahar oh, Stroger. Hey, y'all, Todd is up in here using my supplies. Todd is up I in here am, using my supplies. I'm using supplies. He didn't even ask me, y'all. He just picked it up, started picking my stuff up, spraying it. common good. I didn't, I didn't use it on my side. I used it on where everybody I, 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 I wanted to spray it when I touched the door now. You know, you, we're going to talk about all of this. We're going to talk about these things. Because you know what I was thinking? I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they were telling me how, um, like, at hospitals and nursing homes, the employees are stealing the gloves and the supplies. Uh, they are talking. She, a friend of mine, was telling me about how, so, like in a mixed relationship, the kid came over to somebody's house and took their supplies and took them to their mama house from the girlfriend house. <laughs> and the girl and the mama was like, the the girlfriend was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, I ain't be buying nothing for her. Yeah, yeah. I'm just so we're gonna talk about all of these socially awkward moments that are gonna be created by coronavirus as well. Cause I'm telling you, Ty just came over here. Now the next thing I'm gonna tell you the other thing I've been noticing. These uh these mini sanitizer bottles, they are turning into lighters. You ever had a lighter at a party and it, it like once you put your lighter down, it's gone. If you set your hand sanitizer down, people are taking it. It's all of these little things. That's just thievery. But I, I think if you didn't you if you took it without permission, it's thievery. Period. <laughs> like it don't care. Like you decided what was best for us with my product. You said when I, I came in, would you like to use my Lysol? No, I sprayed you. I didn't say did you want to use it. I sprayed you, and I sprayed the whole office, and I sprayed my Lysol to protect me from you. <laughs> Cause we're in these clothes, but I'm gonna tell y'all, I can't wait to talk about this. This is gonna be so fun. All right, let's go to. Oh, so how about this though? I'm loving. Shout out to Mayor Lori Lightfoot, uh, who has suspended tickets, fines, and all of and and said no evictions. You know, I think that there's got to be a lot of things that have take that we need to do, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little in a little while. Hey, Todd, did you see that Oak Brook has issued? Uh, not Oak Brook, Oak Park. Has issued a shelter in place. I see that. Seems like these mayors are taking things into their own hands. Uh, it seems like. See, I feel like okay. So, do you think like everybody is looking at this as an oppor 
okay, I do think there's some politics here. Like I think like everybody yeah, politics and everything. I think everybody is trying to get the one upsmanship or get their their moment in the okay, I said I was gonna stop. So Oak Park is sheltered in place. I got a friend at Oak Park who said he even he he's expecting to be sheltered in place. And this is a pretty solid guy. He said he went to the store to pick up his uh he had just went he was waiting three days because he had ordered a shotgun and he lives in Oak Park. He was like, I, I'm gonna tell you, Todd, I am on my way to um pick up uh another couple pieces. I just want to be able to make sure nobody can come through the door. Hmm. I'm just saying. I'm saying. I was watching yesterday and I was just thinking like the police drove right by t three times and I was like waiting to call and it's Did like... They never stopped? No, they never stopped. Thanks. No, as a matter of fact, it took them so long that the guys that had the guy handled, uh -huh. he got up and got away and ran away. I mean, it was like a 15 minute, like I'm serious, like I, we were, everybody was outside, the whole grocery store stopped for 15 minutes, but I'm going to tell you what I did learn, when you got a bat or a big old club or something like that, you got to make the one time count, <laughs> because if you're swinging and you, you know, the follow through, the follow through is where you get the problem, because as you coming around and you miss, bam, right in the kisser. Well, they say that with, with actually, with all weapons. If you don't know how to use it, you probably are going to take a, a stab or whatever with it and miss the first time, and then you never know what's going to happen then because now you're you're vulnerable. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, cool. All right, I, you knew. Well, we knew that was going to happen. You see, the mayor's going to be in studio with Lori with uh, Perry Small is going to have Mayor Lori Lightfoot in studio tomorrow at nine o'clock. You all do not want to miss that. Boy, 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 hard work. Lord, have mercy. I'm going to stop. I ain't got nothing to say. All right, let's move on. Uh, did you see, Todd, the world, the political world is changing? Did you see Ed Burke lost his committeeman spot? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Hey, man, Ed Burke lost his committeeman spot. Uh, Madigan lost Lipinski for Congress. And he lost Cara Bernardi. Um Hey, did you see Iris uh, Martinez is not only won that spot, she won the, the committeeman spot. spot. Yeah. Uh, and, let me, okay, so big shout out to, not shout out to, but boy, Victor Reyes was behind the Iris Martinez campaign. Ah. He Now, think about this though. Remember, in Dorothy Brown's office, the speaker had quite a few jobs. Yes. Vic is on the outside with the speaker right now, but Iris controls the jobs. How do you think that's going to work out? Think. Uh, what well, I know... <laughs> and the speaker aren't uh, uh, invite items. Invite them items. Yeah, she's been beating them up about the Me Too thing. Uh -huh. So... Looks like uh, I think he's on the outside right now. I think the speaker is... I mean, I th now, you know where the only place he ain't on the outside? Where? In the black neighborhood. Now, he done, he couldn't defend nothing in the... Um, let me not say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say he had a lot of challenges defending his home turf. Meanwhile, he meddling in the black neighborhoods and y'all still scared. I'm just saying, like... The, what was the thing when the um was it Rome when the Germans started taking pieces of their empire and started getting around the fringe and all of the the barbaric empires started taking pieces? It's like the only people that are staying subjects loyal right now are the black people because everybody else is seeing the blood in the water and they like man let me get a piece right let me get because now he has to nego remember I told you about so now the speaker is in a position where he has to negotiate. For all of those people that he has jobs for, because I'm telling you, if it was me and I was Iris Martinez, I would look for every guy he got and I would fire them all. I would fire them, everybody in the exempt position, and you know they got a lot of exempt positions. Yes, yeah, I'd fire I every single one. To be with and you. then he'd have to call me and ask me for three of the 50 jobs he had back. Yeah. But that's how you play politics. That's how you use power and leverage. Because now he don't got comment. He don't got all these pieces because everybody like, oh, no, 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 no. And he can't pick, pay all those people off the war chest he's building because he's going to need it for politics. See, right now, this is where the Black Caucus right now could put their hands around this throat and say, now, we can help you live or die. Give me all of it. It's Top Chicago 1690. When we come back, Todd, we're going to talk about the coronavirus. Hey, man, it's not a corona bug. What you, what you hitting the mic for, man? It's like it's a virus. I got stuck. <laughs> how, did, how? Okay. How did you get stuck 
How did you get your headphones wrapped around the microphone in that short amount of time? You know, we'll talk about it all when we come back. <laughs> it's Top Chicago 1690. Mm-hmm. They be hiding. <laughs> they be hiding. You know the man don't want to come on the morning show. No, she don't want no parts of this. She don't want no parts of this. Don't none of them want no parts of this. But I'm gonna just tell you. I'm um, all right, Todd. You got the camera. Talk to the people, man. Tell them about coronavirus. Take it serious. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. You know, the difference between this and some of those other viruses, I think Mays alluded to, is. Uh, from what I read, and I maybe I need to read this so more. This thing, this thing uh, can actually damage, put some real damage on you that is long lasting on your lungs. Even if you are healthy and you survive, you don't have the same capacity that you had before. But the what, where, and all that stuff. That sounds scary. My basketball and career will be over. And let's not put it in the 7 o'clock hour. As a matter of fact, I need to look that up, but I'm pretty sure that's what I read. So much stuff. As a matter of fact, every time I go to a, a website, I went to Amazon's website, and they're like, here's what our protocol is for coronavirus. So there's, there's information out there from everywhere. I also went to Amazon Prime. And they were like, no, we're not delivering today. No, we can't deliver tomorrow either. No, They're only delivering today. essentials. Yeah. They're yeah. like household products and stuff like that. But no, I mean, yeah. I think they were saying we are so backed up that... Oh, ain't no, ain't no same day. Yeah. Fresh and lovely, like a dream come true. I'll do anything to spend the night with you. That was a good song. I uh, really yeah. can't stop. Why y'all think the mayor don't want to come on the morning show? I should just wait around and do an ambush interview. Be like, hey, and she gonna come on at nine o'clock, so she knows she gotta walk. Oh, I'm, tomorrow's gonna be lit. Mm. Now let me tell you, I'm sure they're gonna say she wouldn't come on your show. I'd be like, did you really ask her? No, but you know, they people be like, stay away from that, Maze Jackson. All the people be like, they be trying to give me the meme mug. But it's okay. It's like, I think that they're always, remember Tony Preckwinkle? Remember Tony Preckwinkle who was, I'll never do that show. Remember she used to go to everybody. Remember how everybody else went around and went to everybody else's show then when the re-election time came? Everybody was like, oh. the Oh. I think I'm going to have to go. I'll never. It's all good though. Cause I'm gonna be like, huh? Yeah. I kinda look at her as, as the personification of progressives. No, I won't be an ambush interview. I'm a I you know, I think all things in time. And I'ma tell you, I think that we I think that Richard Boykin I think that we are the victims right now of no black bitch. Boykin could have won that race. You know, he won all of the black wards. He won all of the black wards. But he got he got Molly Wops in the suburbs, right? I didn't. I haven't made it all the way to the suburbs yet. I think he yeah he got he got whipped. Uh, what are he doing like Thornton? I didn't look at those places. But um, the challenge becomes. Nobody, who knows how to put it all together And I feel like man We have a I, Did you see the race In the 9th district Did you pay attention to that Which one's The 9th ninth? The ninth was the Aaron Turner race I mean I looked at the, the final results Okay yeah. So you know that the chairman of the Cook County Young Democrats ran in that race No who, who's the chairman I mean, What were they coming on uh, that's the whole point. What war did they come out of? So, they came out. Of, they were uh, when I first met these the 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 chairman. He was with Jason Irvin. He left Jason Irvin 
and was floating and then Carrie Austin gave him you know how he Carrie Austin gave him a letter to charter the 34th ward which he wasn't a part of <laughs> and then he became the chairman of the Young Democrats from the 34th ward from the 34th ward but he wasn't but from he the 34th over, but he lives in on the west side yeah okay I expressly remember last summer talking to the Young Democrats and they was like we raise our own money we make our own decisions we just our own policy and I was like what what fucking Young Democrats is this that right. y'all like? Why and, would why would any ward uh, charter you? If you you're think just a rogue organization. But because then the way Tony Preckwinkle had it set up, the Young Democrats was set up. They it wasn't. It was like their own entity. So once you got the charter, you didn't never have to report back to the committee, right? So they took the. It's so the whole sear the whole process is so fucked up. Like. It's like they put a whole block on the whole chain of progression, right? Like, all of the young Democrats, when people ran, the young Democrats that they worked with were the people who had learned in all their wards and came to help them win their spot. Mm. All of these people ain't never worked on no campaigns, but now they're in the in the process. We don't talk about it at 8 o'clock because it is, it's like we got all of these people who get rewarded for losing. So they never learn how to win, right? And the victory is that they you get a good job for losing. Instead of getting all the jobs, and then it's so crazy. You are tuned in to the Top of Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Mays Jackson. Got my co-host, Todd Stroger. Hey, Todd. Uh, I want to commend Mayor Lori Lightfoot on the actions that she has taken. Uh, even though she ain't took no action to come on the WVON morning show, but I'm going to mm-hmm. let that be. Because she will be on tomorrow at 9 AM at the, um, on the Perry Small Show. Maybe you know I'll cross her in the hallway. They probably gonna be like, they gonna probably be like, uh, they gonna hold her out in the lobby until I get out of here. But I was just thinking like to myself, <laughs> they been had social distancing rules when it comes to the morning show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so can somebody? Okay, before I talk smack, somebody, somebody's gotta ask her, does she regret rec- recruiting people to Chinatown? So I just need somebody to ask that question tomorrow. Somebody just ask. Do you regret? Were you wrong in telling us to come to Chinatown? Huh? She sent you all. Oh, you went to China. Oh, I remember that. You was eating Feng Chao Ku or whatever it's called. Okay. So, yeah, you know. They're going to probably hustle us up out the studio. Look, they're going to put the security guards on me and stuff. Right, right, the right. federal marshals. I'm going to be like, you know, I don't mess with the feds no way. Speaking of the feds, hey, man. Todd, let me ask a question. Do you take the phone call of somebody that you know is under federal investigation? Uh, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not talking about nothing. Yeah, I'll be feeling like mugs be trying to hook you. Cause I, I, well, no, they, they, they are. Right. <laughs> awful lot. But, yeah, I, I always talk like uh, on, on the phone like I'm talking to the feds anyway. Oh, uh, well, I figure that too, but I, I figure if they're going to be on the phone... Like, I, it sounds cute when it's, you know, when it's pretend. But, like, nah, dog, I just sent you the newspaper. No, I'm not taking your call. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want no info. Look, man, I understand, and it's all good. Get yourself together. But it's just like my house at the crib. Like, when you walk through the front door at our house, it's like a zone. You know how, like, when you go into the, um, go, like, you see an airlock on the space movies? Uh-huh. And before you, it's like, <laughs> You come in the front door. You gotta close the. Oh, yeah. You gotta close the door. Then you can't go up to the to the main floor until after you take off everything that you had and took a spray. And then you go up the floor. And then Carrie is like, "Okay, spray the groceries." I'll be like, "Baby, you can't spray lights on the groceries." She said, "Well, you better get some alcohol and water, but you better spray them groceries. <laughs> Don't put nothing up in here. It's like a bubble." Okay, but the mayor. You know, one of the things that has concerned me. And one of the things that I am uh, concerned about is the fact that uh, how do you pay your bills? 
if you can't go to work. Did you see the Park Hyatt and the Peninsula just closed? Um, hotels are closing, restaurants are closing, all the wait staff. Yeah, my all dry cleaners just sent us a notice last night. They're closing their three locations. Oh, see? Man. Um, so the question becomes now. How do you sustain yourself during this time? President Trump is talking about sending out two checks. A stack apiece. I'm taking that check. I'm just telling you. Yup, yeah. And anybody, any Trump haters, just sign it over. Pay to the order of Mays Jackson. Do they tax those checks? Or do you get a straight stack? That's a good, good question. I'd have to... And do you have to report that on your... As income. Right. Probably not. I would guess because that would... Yeah, that would be kind of... Got to be kind of self. Okay, so what are the things that we need to do? What things can be done to ease the stresses of the coronavirus? Also, the mayor said that she is not going to. Um, there's going to be no water shutoffs. There'll be no uh, evictions. There'll be no tickets and fines unless it is public safety related. How many public safety violations you think they're going to find on the black side of town? Like them bicycle tickets. Black people gonna be like, how I get a ticket in a ticket moratorium? <laughs> <laughs> but what other things can they do? Like I was thinking like, if you live, cause they were saying most Americans only have about $400 in their savings, right? And so if you don't have $400 in your savings, I was just thinking I bought probably a thousand dollars worth of food over the last week. That's not hoarding, just so y'all know. It's just I got a variety. Of, I just don't want, you know, I got to have some variety. Right, right. You, <laughs> like, yeah, I want to have. You're talking about cooking. Yeah. I want rice, yeah. but I want some flavored rice, you know. Got put. And I've been trying to tell my daughter, you know, I came downstairs and my daughter had eaten the pizza. And she threw away the pepperonis because she don't eat. I was like, we going to need them. <laughs> Give me the pepperonis. You didn't put them in a plastic bag. Can I tell you, I talk about Carrie Mama and them because they freeze everything. Let me tell you, if they eat half a donut and they ain't finished with it, they will put that bad boy. You go in the freezer, and it is. I'm going to tell you, my mother-in-law got stuff in the freezer from two years ago. She be like, I'm through with this cake, but I'm going to freeze it. You go in, you can't put nothing in the freezer because they will freeze everything. But look, I felt like I was carried yesterday because I was like, Milan, you took the, pe the pepperonis off the pizza, and you ain't put them pepperonis and in the plastic bag. Oh my. She was like, oh, Dad, what are you talking about? It's like that because the millennials don't get it. But I want to know what are the other things that we can do to ease the stress of coronavirus. I was thinking like, can they flatten the price of, can they stop the price of surging food prices? Because I'm telling you now, you go to any black grocery store, store in the black neighborhood, there is no chicken. You think I'm playing? You think I'm playing? Go look for some chicken. No. The only thing up there is chicken black backs. Yeah. You know the chicken back is like eating. You know, have you ever tried to eat a chicken back before? I can't stand that. <laughs> that's, that's your grandma now. Yeah. They be like, but baby, give me that chicken back. Give me them that turkey neck. Um, think about. I think you're right. I did go to to the grocery store and I, and there were there was something I can't remember what I was looking for, but there was chicken parts I couldn't find. Right. No, you can't find wings. You can't find drumsticks. You can't find breasts. So my question is, what other thing? You saw the story about the, I got it. You saw the story about the corner store in y'all neighborhood. Where they was charging $80 for toilet paper. You <laughs> see Menards uh, charging $8 for Clorox bottles. Really? Under investigation. Now, Menards is doing that. And, I, I, love, and I love Menards. Can I tell you, I can walk around Menards. Menards is like a fake Costco for me. <laughs> like, I, Because I can walk around Costco for like two hours and yeah. not buy nothing. Just be like, oh, this is cool. Menards yeah. is like that for a little bit. Todd, what other things can be done? Give us a call, 312-374-8130. What are the challenges that you're facing during the coronavirus? And what can you do? What can the government, or shoot, I feel like now I feel like a democratic socialist. But what can be done by the government to help alleviate that? So I think, like, could they freeze mortgage payments? Like, is there a way to stimulate the banks to freeze mortgage payments so you're, because think about how many people's credit, even if this thing lasts three, 
months or if it was to last three months Man, and you come out and your credit is jacked you still you didn't get kicked out of your house but your credit is jacked yeah yeah and so it sets you back and now you can't buy a house that goes right into golf season see you but see you know, time. golf season you can go out by yourself you don't have to be around people so <laughs> well, at least we got that. Thank yeah, God we saved God. So, Todd um, and WVON listeners, what things could be done to help? What do you, what can be done to relieve the stress associated with coronavirus? Some of the things I thought were um, small business assistance. So, I think like think about all of the small businesses that are gonna send people home. I was I was talking to another friend yesterday who was telling me about a catering company that is go- think about like that like some of these like the sports teams and the multi billion dollar people have the ability to pay their remember their remember like the NBA I mean the, the Major League Baseball is putting in, every team is putting in a million dollars to pay the staff and then players are chipping in they got hundreds of millions of dollars can I tell you as a small business owner I'm worried about will my clients pay their invoices. Right, right. right? And if my clients pay. don't pay their invoices, then I'm screwed. Right. Right? Because they don't have the ability, so. And I'm a small business owner. But who, where do I get relief? Right? And the people that work for me are looking at me like, uh, what's going to happen? And I'm saying, uh, right. Uh, I mean, I'm not, it also. It's a domino effect. It is a domino effect. So, um, what are some of the things that the government can do to make sure, and that we can do collectively, to make sure that we don't all crumble during this 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 coronavirus shutdown? Because I'm gonna tell you that, Todd, I really do feel like if you already see Oak Park is saying shutter and shelter in place, the mayor is taking over all the TV stations. You know, it's something going down if she coming to WVON. <laughs> you're right. You know she something is up. Person, she right. coming in person? You know something is up. Hey, y'all, it's the Talk Chicago 1690. We'll be back. Uh, Keith, when we come back, I'll take your calls. Talk Chicago 1690. She's coming here. I went to a, they had a meeting on Monday, and I invited her to uh, run PSAs, and I said we'd definitely give her inventory. And then so she's coming here to record a PSA, and then she's going to come on Perry Small Show. She might be in our way. We want to do our promo. <laughs> you don't do it for one Fridays. Oh, that's right. It's all a setup. All a no, you guys, you gotta get up. We all right. <laughs> Y'all get out of here. Y'all so, hurry up. So I, I tried to get her in early. The, the only slot in her calendar she can provide us with was nine to nine forty-five to do it all. Record mm-hmm. the PSA and come on very small and go on WRLL too. No. Oh. She's gonna hable español. They'll do it in bilingual. Half and half. I was thinking, do we have? Do we have? <laughs> do we have? Like, do we have medical people? You know, I want to get my dean, my aunt Dean, on the show. She did uh, high risk. What she was a? Basically, she dealt with like. You mind? You at Jackson Park, right? Oh, sure. oh, okay. No, she was at Jackson Park forever. She does like all of the highly infectious diseases. Like for thirty years, she's like super high tech specialist on it. Mm-hmm. And it's like she used to like she would not let us walk up the ha- up the stairs with your shoes on. Like she is like she knows where. All, like straight up, she's like you know. I love and actually I tried to get her for Monday, but she called in. Monday's boss radio. No Tuesday. I think I called her too. I talked talk to Cheryl her. Dr. Cheryl Whitaker and Dr. Susan McKinney are going to be in for you on Monday. Why are we doing? She's not a doctor. She is a pandemic and population expert. The and same one has, who came on. She has a doctor too. She is a doctor. We, no, that's but we, she did that before. Yeah. And she was not there. She is a qualified person, an expert on situations that affect tons of people and emergency and disaster situations. Mm. That's why she's coming on. She went around her. She went around her people. Let me just say that. Um, I always think like the people that you 
who brought you to the dance, you stick with the people who brought you to the dance. You don't look for the next person who you think can. Well, there's two types of people. There's the people who stick with the people who came with them, who brought them to the table, and then there's the people that climb, right? Right. There's the people that say, here's my chance to, like, you know we're going to talk about that at 8 o'clock too, because I think, I think that there is such a desire to build white to to get success in the white world and get and be an employee when you could run your own shit on the black side. Yeah, but you know, running a business is is harder than being an employee. And that's not for my guess. That's not my guess. Monday. Wait. No, that's not my guess. That's not my guess. That's not my guess. She's coming on a Monday, right? right? You said my guess. No, I'm not going to be on it. That's what I told you. I'm going to be on it Monday. That's Bye, not what you said. You said that's going to be your guest. Every little thing is going to be all right. This morning. Smiled at the rising sun. Sweet little birds. Beside my doorstep. Singing sweet songs. Melodies true and true. This is my message to you. Singing don't worry. About a thing. Every little thing is going to be all right. Singing don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about that thing, no. Every little thing will be all right. So rise up this morning. Smile at the rising sun. Sweet little birds beside my doorstep. Singing sweet songs of melodies pure and true. Singing, this is my message to you. You are tuned in to the Talk of Chicago, 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host, Ty Stroger. Ty, don't worry about a thing. Because we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right, y'all. But I'm going to tell you what. We're going to talk about black preparedness at 730. Like, what are we doing for ourselves? I've been talking about this forever. But what I want to know right now is, what can the government business do to to, to ease the stress associated with the coronavirus? I was just talking about the small businesses. The mayor is cutting all evictions and, no, excuse me, cutting all bills, water cutoffs, fines. Is the elect is the, is ComEd gonna say when do we get the letter from ComEd that says uh you know what we are going to make sure that nobody's power is cut we ain't even gonna send you no pink slips to add to your concern and stress during this time right mm-hmm. think about that because can you imagine having a disconnect notice and knowing you ain't got no job and you know what that pink one look like because the envelope got that red stripe on it it'd be like everybody know you gotta pay the bill. Uh, uh, I've never seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I told you I used to play the game. Um, and now, this is all happening at the same time when the shutoffs are supposed to start happening at the most time because you got three consecutive days of warm weather. Is ComEd going to jump in? Uh, what things can we do? Let's go to Keith. Keith, you're on the top of Chicago. What? what? <laughs> Sorry. What things can be done to alleviate some of the stress associated with coronavirus? Uh, good morning. Good morning. I, I would uh, I would say that people would be in some type of financial hardship, or at least they're, they're going to be. So what the federal government can do is uh, make the federal income tax uh, uh, a holiday it, so that during this event uh, uh, you're not paying federal income taxes. I would also include the federal gas tax. Uh, I would also include any uh, domestic federal taxes just in general. Um, and as for also to make a law, uh, they would uh, should enforce usury laws, create and enforce usury laws 
What I mean by that is that the uh, I would imagine that people will need credit, and the, often these credit card companies have rates as high as 25 percent when the going rate is should be 3.75. Something like that is ridiculous. That should be enforced from now on, uh, we, regardless of what event is happening within the nation. Okay, uh, you know, Keith, I think those are some great suggestions. I appreciate that. Hey, uh, are you? Uh, I know the restaurants are calling for. Um, the restaurants are calling to to for a uh, stimulus package. Yes, yes, I saw Sam Toya on the on the news. Right. Um, what do you do about all of those employees? So, is do we have food banks? Are there going to be like places where you could just go pick up free food? Like, are there going to be we food? But I mean, I think they probably need to expand it because I'm gonna tell you, um, food depositories for people who were who were not dependent on food shelters. Think about it. Mm. Think about people who, not the people who are like, oh, I'm going to line up, but the people who are like, man, I serve, I do service. Like at a restaurant, like the people who work at, say, for instance, Gibson's. By the way, did you see Gibson's is having a steak sale? What? <laughs> Gibson's is having a steak sale. Right they selling raw steak because they don't want to keep all the steak in the freezer. Right. So they're trying to get it out. So you can go buy Gibson, and they said you get a bottle of wine with it, too. Now, I don't know if you can kick it the same, but I am suggesting, guys, like even like for our restaurants with inventory, is somebody going to buy that inventory from them? Is there, how, you know, I just, like, are we, what are the things that, can, I, I got to calm it down just a little, but what are the things that can be done to alleviate the pain that comes with this? I'm even asking about entertainment. Like, to me, Netflix, Hulu, Fox. You saw Fox is giving up their their app for free, no, but really? yeah. But think about Not that I know what's on there. Think about. Uh, can I tell you something? You know what's the most ignorant thing? I and I I, I know y'all gonna laugh at me because you don't say this is what you get. But the Soho House sent me a note saying, "Hey, by the way, don't forget we about to debit your account for your your membership fees." Now y'all know damn well, ain't nobody coming to the Soho House for three months. That's why they want to get that money right now. But again, and but again, it's a trickle down effect because they do want to take care of their people. They don't have maybe. I was just thinking like I would love the opportunity to give my employees their salary and say I could cover you while you're gone. I can't. I get that. I I I and I don't know like I don't know where to turn. Right. I, fortunately, I built up my reserve. You know, they say keep at least three months of salary and expenses exactly. in the bank. So I'm, I'm, I'm straight with that. But what do I do about the people that rely on me? Um, hmm. and I'm not looking at it now when things are good, still relatively good because we haven't felt it. Like when. When you spray this bottle and this bottle now in in three in a month is now fifteen dollars for a sanitizer and you was just willy nilly spraying it on the walls, right? Right? How do I, I? These are the things that are going through my mind. What happens when there's not hand sanitizer? Is there going to be a place where you can go and load up for hand sanitizer and the things that you need? I don't know because you can't, can't find that kind of stuff right now. And so, what is going to be done? And what can be done to protect people as this happens? And I just, and, and, and this gets to another point where I'm talk. I want to go to at 730 when we talk about black self-reliance. What infrastructure do we have in place? And it's going to lead into our 8 o'clock conversation when we talk about our black political bench. Think about this right now. And I, I really hate to be morbid. But think about how many of the black leaders in power right now fit in the high risk category. Whether they're seniors. I mean, think about it. From Tony Preckwinkle, Danny, Bobby, all of our... Just uh, think about all of the people that are high risk right now. Okay. And what happens... To our political future with these people that we have been trained, not trained. Let's talk Chicago, 1690. We'll be back. The station, 1690 AM. So think about all of the people that are high risk 
that if, if an epidemic hit them, we are so politically inequipped because we have been politically neutered. Right now, white folks are donating to themselves, to themselves. They are donating to their own communities. They are now becoming self-reliant knowing that they cannot rely on the government. They are relying on their own personal and individual wealth while you have built yours on social services. Right? Think about how many white billionaires. Just think, think about how many black millionaires. And then I want y'all to understand, ooh, they got a typo. No, seriously. So right now, our political fate, establishment-wise, is in the hands of people who couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag. Seriously. When you see the fact, I, you know, I did that whole post on fundraiser that can't fundraise. Yeah. That was real. As hell. Like, the political consultants that we got... Consult, you are not a political consultant because JB paid you $20,000 a month. <laughs> he paid you $20,000 a month that so, well paid. so that he could answer the question, what's in it for the black people? They paid you to get the fuck out the way. They didn't pay you. You wasn't in the strategy meetings. It's like, you know what? I'm going to tell you something, Todd. And it's so frustrating because every time I invest in someone politically, not every time, but so many times when I invest in them politically, they take the shortcut. It's like you take people, they see all the political relationships, you introduce them to people, then they feel like they got they got it. Then they run for office, right? You run for office. Yeah, because just about everybody wants to do that in the end. Right. And you run for office, and instead of Sticking with your team that's having you run for office to win. And following the processes and going through the steps. You take the shortcut. Go around how you got there. Lose. But they reward you for losing by making you politically inept. You know when you lose a race? It makes you. It puts a fire in your belly. Right? It makes you say. What did I. It, there's two ways you can respond to losing a race. You can say, I wanted it, and now I'm going to go back because I can calculate my mistakes and I'm going to go after it. Or what they do is if they see you got potential, you know what they say? Let's make you fat and lazy mm -hmm. instead of making you a warrior. We don't want you training. So here, I'm going to give you an innocuous space where you can go out and take all the pictures you want to take, but you won't become a political force. Right? So now, when it's time for you to win, you got this inflated sense of ego because everybody been letting you come to all the parties and you've been getting fat, feeling like you one of them. When, and then when it's time, can I, JB didn't donate a stitch. Right? Like, he was donating for the white girl up north. Y'all was on the same campaign. But we feel like when we get the association with the white folks, it's better than working our way up and building our own shit. And I would rather get my ass kicked five times and on that fifth time know how to fight because right now, all the opportunities are available. And we have, like, so all these spots are about to open up for a variety of reasons. And we got a bunch of selfie taking, never worked on a campaign, never had to grow. Everybody's been an outreach director. That's the easiest way to make your ass impotent. Hmm. If you take the outreach job, it's impotency. You take field because you go out and you put the grassroots relationships down. It's like you got people talking shit. Who ain't never won a campaign. You, you cannot talk shit in Illinois if you won a campaign with J.B. Pritzker. You can't. That's not credibility. It's not. And it's funny to me to see all of the black strategists 
who ain't never been to a fundraising meeting. And if you ain't in a fundraising meeting, you ain't part of the strategy. Just so you know, you are a tool of the strategy. We got policy directors who ain't got no real life experience. How your policy? And it's like, we got this microwave generation. Like, think about this. They short circuited our whole. So, be, like in my young Democrat class, right? Think about how the progression should have gone. It should have been like the Chris Andersons, the Mazes, the Carrie did it, right? Mm -hmm. But that whole generation got usurped for the most part by this next generation who has no political experience. So when you when the president of the Young Democrats ran for something for us, every Young Democrat, even though we was doing battle as as in, in our wards, mm -hmm. all of us were doing battle so that when one of us ran, we could all go help. Yeah. You had the tools in the toolbox. We got all of these people in our space that ain't never did shit. Nothing. And when Tony Preckwinkle got elected, she elevated all these people based on they, they adjectives. And none of the adjectives included win. Mm -hmm. You are tuned in to Talk Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host, Todd Stroger. Hey, Todd. You know how we do at the top of the hour. Got to say what's up to the WVOA Morning Show team. What's up to Jennifer Thompson in the newsroom as well as Sonia Escobar. Sonia, was that the Bee Gees? Was that the Bee Gees? So I had to get out the way. You have to ask that question. Dibby doo! Dibby doo! But dibby dibby doo! I could tell. That's why I knew. That's why I was my first guest. Yeah. I knew you mean. I knew you. No way you're going to get that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it is the WBON Morning Show. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Ty. It is the anniversary today. Of? Of the Weston, Texas team winning the championship. With five black stars. Western? NCAA. Western or Western? Western. Oh, Western. Oh, Glory Road. Can yeah. I tell you what? The big guy in that was from Bolingbrook in the movie. Oh, really? He played. The big guy, his boy, his name is Shin Kerr. His brother was our star quarterback. Uh, he played the big man that yeah, came. Yeah. I can't remember his name. But he was in that movie. And Glory Road, you know what I used to talk about the Glory Road team? Was when my son played at Saint, uh, Saint at Christ the King. Uh-huh. And we were the only integrated team in the Catholic League Southwest. Really? So, for the most part. Like, there would be one guy, and you knew who he was. But, whenever we went into the gyms, because we had an integrated team, I used to call us the Glory Road team. Because <laughs> they would be in there like, right? I was like, is this, is this Christian? You mean St. Barnabas was in there? Oh, my God. St. Barnabas was like, hold on. Really? <laughs> oh, my God. I remember, I remember, I was like, who is the guy in the crew cut coaching over there? It turned out to be the alderman. I was like, he had one of them, you know, he had one of those haircuts that, you know, like when the police stop you at that cop, get out the car with that haircut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, uh, you, you know what time it is. Yeah. All right, speaking of knowing what time it is, we got to make sure here at WVON that our listening audience really knows what time it is when it comes to this coronavirus you know y'all i am i traffic and rumor and innuendo but i i really want to make sure that we do a good job in providing information 
uh, to the black community surrounding this because we need we got we need information that we can trust. You know, yesterday my wife scolded me, uh, and I'm gonna take it because she said, you know, Maze, yesterday when you were on the show, I know you like to tell jokes, but this stuff is really serious, and. I, she's like, you got a big listening audience, and when you when they listen, they trust what you say. And so, what I wanted to do today was get past Maze's entertainment and really get down to the soup and nuts of this whole coronavirus. Really trying to help us distinguish the difference between fact and fiction. Things that we should know, things we can do to help ourselves and prevent ourselves. And so, when I look for a trusted medical resource you know i got to go to chicago's first family of medicine right i'm gonna go ahead black chicago's first family of medicine you got dr eric whitaker i'm gonna tell you what dr eric whitaker he'll be like maze you got this wrong i'll be sitting here doing my show and then the next thing i get a text but then there is also the lovely dr cheryl whitaker who you all know her from formerly from next level health always on the front lines of trying to make sure that our community has the best health care. Uh, she's going to be joining us regularly over the next few weeks as we combat this virus. But here to talk to us today, fact versus fiction, y'all welcome back Dr. Cheryl Whitaker. Welcome back Dr. Whitaker. Good morning guys, how y'all doing morning. this morning? I am trying, to, I'm doing good, Ty, Ty would keep his social distance. He keep breathing on me over here. I keep and then and the I, table is three and a half feet. I, there's no way. I can and get then he keep talking loud, and I be thinking them droplets are coming across the thing. I'm thinking we got to get a shield or something up here so that I can do. But Dr. Whitaker, you know what? Um, you know we are laughing, but this is really no laughing matter. It is serious. It is taking place around the world, and I. I'm, I'm going to just get into my questions because I, I trust you and I think our listening, and I know our listening audience can trust you to tell us the truth. First of all, Doc, what is the coronavirus exactly? Because I see it on the back of all of these cans and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like it's not as new as we thought it was, but what is mm -hmm. going, what is it, what is this coronavirus novel, COVID-19? Well, you know, I think before I tell you what COVID-19 is, I want to go back to your point that you see it on the back of different cans of, you know, uh, disinfectants. Common human coronaviruses have been around for years and years. In fact, it's it's what you call it, the common cold. It produces symptoms of the common cold. And there are different types, and they have names like 229E, NL63, 0C43, um, those called mild to moderate upper respiratory tract infections like a common cold. Now, this new one, now called COVID-19, um, has arisen, uh, it, it, aris it arose out of China. <coughs> they believe it went... You okay over there, Doc? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little... I got a cold myself. I think I got one of the coronas, but not COVID-19. Let me All tell right. you, because I'm going to tell you, I, every time somebody at the house coughs, everybody looks up and be like, oh, you're mm -hmm. Well, you know, my daughter was in Walgreens the other day. She said she coughed and everybody looked at her. So she ran out of the store. So <laughs> we, <laughs> she's like, let me get out of here. Um, but for the common human coronaviruses, you got runny nose, sore throat, <clears throat> headache, fever, cough. Um, but for COVID-19, it's a little bit different. Um, it's new. Um, there's no immunity, and it appears to have more severe symptoms than the common cold that a lot of us already know about. And you, you know, every year people experience getting a cold, right? Like not everyone, but many of us do. It's, you know, spread by respiratory droplets, contact, um, close together, you know, sort of situations. Spread very similarly. But what we know about COVID-19, yes, it's a coronavirus. We have no treatment for it. And, and importantly, it seems to be even more contagious than any coronavirus we've seen. It is as contagious as measles. Do you guys remember measles? If you looked at someone with measles back in the day before it was the, the vaccines were widely available, you got measles, right? It was super contagious. Mm. So coronavirus is very contagious, and then it has more severe impact on the lungs. So when you hear the feds, when you hear governors talking about uh, concerns about running out of uh, ventilators, is that when people come into the hospital, 
the, the reason they're in is because they've got a s- severe lung involvement and they need an intubator in order to get through it. Many get through it, and then as we know, you know, 30 to 40 percent of people, it looks well, 20, 25 percent, depending on the age range we're talking about, don't get through it. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Back up, mm-hmm. back up, back yes. up, back up. So this is what, because like, you're getting to my questions. So you talked about kind of, well, first of all, how do you get it? And if you get it, are, will you surely die, as they say in the Bible? <laughs> so remember, the, the death rate looks to be about 20%, okay? So two out of 10 people who get it will likely die. That's what we've seen across the world. Um, and we're particularly able to, to see now to look at China. We're able to look at Korea, South Korea. We're not able to look at North Korea, right? Because they might shoot you over there if you get it. Um, On the spot is what I'm hearing. <laughs> uh, and in Italy, we're able to see, okay, so 20% of population overall, 2 out of 10. But if you're older, and particularly older than 60, and the, as you go up, the mortality or the number of people who die increase, okay? So the older you get, if you have underlying conditions, you're, you're more susceptible to that bug getting in. Let me stop you right and, there. Let me stop okay. you right there because you said underlying conditions. I want to just try and make sure some of these things that oftentimes people say, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, I know, but they don't necessarily know. What are underlying conditions? And then after you tell me what those are, we're going to go to traffic and weather. What are Very underlying good. conditions? Well, mate, you're doing a great job slowing me down. Thank you so much. Underlying conditions. Any kind of lung disease like asthma or COPD. Hold on. Asthma. Mm-hmm. Listen to that, black folks. Asthma. While you walking around here talking about black folks don't get it. Asthma. Go ahead. <laughs> Asthma, COPD. So those are things that directly impact the health of the lungs, right? And then other conditions that affect the overall kind of performance of the immune system, okay? Diabetes has immunologic kind of implications, and we can come back and talk about that at some point. Maybe you want to break it down further, Mm -hmm. but trust me here, diabetes. Did y'all hear that? If your sugar ain't right, you got a problem. Go ahead. Well, you're more susceptible, right? Uh, Rheumatoid arthritis, you know why? Because you're usually taking some kind of immuno-altering medication, and it changes your immune system function. If you're if you are uh, on cancer treating drugs, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, most cancer treating drugs they alter um, kind of the blood function and, and immune function. Let okay? me stop you right there, Doc, because I've got to go to traffic and weather. But when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation, Doctor Cheryl Whitaker, first family of Black medicine in Chicago, trying to get us straight on this whole coronavirus. Let's we'll be back. More of the morning show with Maze Jackson coming up. <laughs> Todd and Sonia, y'all got that. Yeah, that, um... <laughs> Maze is using lights out like it's, uh... <laughs> like it's uh, some kind of, uh... There's long, Jamaican he's spraying it and walking into it. Uh, video of it. But yeah, that, that asthma, you and, know, and as I always and say, and adults die of asthma because on, they kind of, uh, They tend to ignore it. Even though I know a, a friend of mine died recently of asthma, and she didn't actually ignore it, but her her uh, recovery medicine didn't do the job. I don't think she actually had enough at the time. So yeah, you got to be real careful with uh, with asthma. You realize it it never goes away. You always you always need to to have something to to help you get more air in your lungs. Yeah, you would think that there's an ambulance close enough that would help you recover. But man, these things can happen so fast. And if you do something and it's not working and you didn't call the ambulance first, you might be in some real trouble probably better to call an ambulance and then try to, to use whatever you got. Of course, most people wouldn't want to do that because those things are so expensive. Makes them wonder, 
now that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be closer to the senior age, I don't have any underlying issues, I don't think. No sugar. No asthma. I do have a question for the doctor. That can this have a, that after you get over it, does it have uh, any lasting effect on your respiratory system? Yeah, that's, a, that's the exact question I want to ask. I remember that. And we got so much time together at home, we got to make some real plans. All right. On Friday, we all are going to handle this room. This will be your job. This will be your job. This will be your job. I mean, I think that this is going to be a very big cost-cutting oh, hey, measure. Did I tell you like, a friend of mine's got several ARs he's selling? ARs. Oh yeah, you did. Uh, for four? Uh, like four or five. He wants them. They're like six, seven hundred dollar guns. I'll take. And he wants how much? Like four or five, depending on what you want. Does he got ammo? I don't know. I'll take it. I'll, I'll take one. Today. I would. Maze, we're having like zombie apocalypse conversations. We're having like zombie apocalypse conversations. You are tuned in to Talk Chicago, 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host, to a hard stroger. My dad loved the song. We had this album at home. You had this. I, you know what? It, what This is who? Diana Washington. I think I listened to her album once on title, and I was pretty impressed. Like, I, it doesn't have all... It's, it's simple. The music is simple, but I will tell you that it was very peaceful. Like, I was cooking, and I was feeling like Bill Cosby-esque. Not the rapey Bill Cosby, but the Bill Cosby, um, like Cliff Huxtable. Cliff, yeah. Cliff, I was feeling kind of Cliff Huxtable-ish. Uh, but hey, y'all, speaking of what is going on right now, we have on the live line uh, one of the members of the first families of the medical, uh, the, the first family of medicine in Chicago, Dr. Cheryl Whitaker. You remember her from, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Next Level Health. Shout out to Dr. Eric Whitaker and Zing Health. Um, Dr. Whitaker, uh, you were telling us underlying conditions. Let's wrap that because I got a few more questions. So can you get through those underlying conditions, particularly the ones that are impactful to black people? When you said asthma and diabetes, a.k.a. your sugar is up, I was like, black folks, pay attention. Go ahead, Dr. Whitaker your point made it goes to the fact that we're we're all susceptible and the first person to die uh in the chicago was an african-american retired nurse from so auburn gresham that is correct right here in our community and no one knows how she got it so it was likely through kind of community spread meaning this this is sort of traveling through our community now and there are people who are who are not sick who appear to be carrying it um so asthma copd diabetes cancer if you're on, you have rheumatoid arthritis or any other conditions where you're taking a medicine that changes your immune system, cancer, you know, particularly you're undergoing cancer treatment right now. I think those are kind of the big ones that people should be aware of. All right, Doc. I got a quick question. Go ahead. If uh, you do get it and you're, you know, you're healthy and all that, does it leave any uh, uh, lasting uh, respiratory problems? You know, no, because so by and large, that's a really good question. By and large, when people get it, if they when they recover, they recover fully is what we've seen. 
That sounds good. Okay, that's good because I was told that there was lung scarring that happens for young people if yeah, they get was, it. That's I why I wanted to make sure. Um, well, well, wait, wait, wait. There, uh, there's always gradations, guys. There's always a continuum. Can you get lung scarring if you have a particular bad case? Yes. Okay, but by and large, people recover. Is if from if that's what we've seen in China, and that's what we've seen in Italy and South Korea for people who recover. No, Doc. I'm trying to figure this out. How do I prevent from getting it? I mean, I get this social distancing thing, staying away from people. But what what other protective measures can we take to prevent from getting it? Because I must be honest with you, and I'm I, again, I want to be clear. I'm confused. I am confused where if we're supposed to be keeping distance, how do they determine that some places you can go and some places you can't? So how do you get it, right? Like, again, because I'm still coming to work and people well, are good, going to work. Good question. So what we're learning, remember, remember Italy. If you follow Italy, you're looking at what the United States and other countries are trying to avoid, Okay. If you've been to Italy, you know there's goo gobs of people there. There's tons of tourists. They've got a, a vital kind of uh, what a fashion industry, which probably explains why someone from northern Italy, Milan area, was back and forth between China mm -hmm. and there. Um, so it's being being around people is just like um, the other coronaviruses, the common cold that I was telling you about. So it's it's spread by people coming together, people breathing on each other, kissing, sharing any kind of mucus, you know. Dang! Fluids. Wait a minute, Doc. Now, we got to be in the house all this time, and you talk about no kissing, no hugging, no, come on now. We thought, I thought we was going to have, we was going to be replacing the population that we lost <laughs> by next January. Well, we need you to hold off. Uh, if, you know, if there's somebody you don't know, of course, if there's someone you know, you should continue. Okay, thank you. Because um, I was heard, I heard somewhere <laughs> that they said continuous sex prevents the disease. Now, is that true or not? May, will you stop, please? Right. <laughs> I saw that. I'm telling you. I saw. I saw it on Facebook. It must be real. It must be real. But please, guys. That's why I need please. you to tell us the truth. Okay. Because if there's one thing I want people to take away, it's not that. Okay. Okay. Got, <laughs> but, it. got it. But here's the thing. How do you get it? It's it's close contact. It's interacting. And now we're learning that it stays alive on surfaces, um, uh, particularly, uh, I believe it's steel and plastic for three days. Um, so you want to wipe down surfaces in your house as you kind of move around your own home. Um, so that's the key. It's person-to-person -person transmission. Um, and now we find that it lives on surfaces. So respiratory droplets, droplets are in the air about 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, you can walk into some of those if you're around somebody who's coughed or sneezed. But here's the thing. If you're home, if you're sick, stay home. That's the social distancing piece, right? It stays six feet away from people. Don't get in their space. You can avoid their droplets. Um, they're kind of breathing the germs on you or coughing or sneezing them on you. Um, wash your hands. If you touch somebody, you know, if you touch a surface, now they want you to wash your hands really all the time. They want you to wipe down your surfaces with with bleach or uh, other... I'm using hand sanitizer, sanitizer right now as hand we talk. Sanitizer. You know what? As you think about it, do it. Um, cover your mouth and nose when you're coughing and sneezing. A lot of these things are things we say about the common cold, right? Except now they coughing in your elbow w won't work. We need you to get a tissue and cough into that tissue. But what if you can't find a tissue? Well, just real talk. It ain't no tissues around here. It's all the way in the bathroom. So what do I do in those cases? And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm saying like there's degrees to this you know like if you go to a black bathroom like certain places they don't have tissues they don't even have hand some people only have hand dryers so what do you do in that case well you want to use basic sort of common sense if you know you've coughed in your into your sleeve okay um then you know one you want to social distance and then you know when you get home you want to throw that into the washing machine and wash it okay okay so you know, just basic common sense. I don't, and I agree with you. Let's calm down the hysteria. Think about the common cold and what you do to try to keep that from spreading to other people. You want to do this. The reason why you want to do it is novel. We haven't seen it. It's more lethal than a common cold. It can grab onto that lung tissue, cause pneumonias that cause people to die. It's more lethal to older people. So while you may be young and you get it, you may then spread it to people that you care about who are older. But please remember, when you look at the stats of all over the world, half the people 
who are on ventilators are younger than 60. So if you're in the 20 to 60 range, yes, you can still be impacted. So we want younger people also to remember that they can also get sick. They don't get sick as much, but they can still get sick, Maze. So common sense, you know, let's not get hyster hysterical. Wash your hands, wipe down surfaces, don't touch your nose and mouth, avoid close contact with people that you know are sick, and in this case, we're asking you, slow down the spread and transmission by staying six feet away from everyone. That's why they shut down the bars. Well, and they tried to, I guess they can shut down the beaches in Florida. <laughs> People are like, Spread. forget that, right? <laughs> but, 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 all, but you got, God knows how much, how much is spreading across Florida now because all those people were in such close proximity to others. That, we'll see over the next few days, right? Gotta stop you. Yeah. Chicago, let's do what the mayor's asking us to do, the governor's asking us to do. We don't want to be Italy. There it is. Hey, y'all, that is the first. I, you know what? She is the surgeon. I'm declaring her the black surgeon general of Illinois. That is Dr. Cheryl Whitaker, our first family of medicine right here. We'll talk about, when we come back, we're going to be talking about black readiness. Are we really ready? Todd, and she'll be back. Oh, she'll be uh, doing Boss Radio on Monday. She'll be sitting in with Dr. Uh, Suzette McKinney as well. Mm -hmm. They'll be here on Monday, Monday, Monday. All right, y'all, we'll talk to you when we come back. It's Talk Chicago 1690. Live from the WBON Newsroom, here's our news now. I think they're sitting at the other end of the table. That's funny. No. Like their keys? Oh, we should have sat. We should have put them sat there and there, and we could have got the six feet. Like if you broadcast it from over there, you could get the six. You can actually just spin that around, and you can sit there, and he can sit here. Totally across. Um, friend of mine from the pizza place, and they're still open. Well, you're from what? Sit down. Just take out and delivery a pizza place. Mm -hmm. Somebody used the bathroom. He had one of those giant rolls of toilet paper that are locked in the thing. Somebody broke the thing and stole his toilet roll. Dang. You know the big wheel rolls? Yeah. First of all, my bathroom would be locked. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to use the bathroom. Well, he left, that was like the first day. You know. I, I got you. Work. No, I get it. I'm just saying. It's like, bro, take out. Like, no, nah, you can't get nothing. So I ordered a pizza last night and. Uh, wasn't allowed to go into the building and they took my credit card over the phone as opposed to, you know, when you get there you just give it to them. Yeah, how do you get the pizza? They, they, you call them when you get there and then they bring it out to you. Oh, they bring it out to your car? Yep. Oh. Yeah, I mean, Dunkin' Donuts, they like, don't touch your coffee, they'll hand it to you. Uh-huh. Um, I'm just worried, I don't want, like, I'm gonna tell you what, if I wake up and Dunkin' Donuts is closed, I'm serious. I'm really going to be like, that's really going to shake me. The apocalypse me. is happening. I'm going to tell you, it's going to shake me. It really is. Um, because. <laughs> that's what it is for you over the top. Huh? Well, I'm saying, the NCAAs made me think it was real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the cancelization of the NCAA. See, I almost feel like right now, because everybody is going to be hit by this, that there needs to be like a left, like. I don't know how you do it. I don't, but I feel like nobody's really gonna make money except for the the, the companies. Like, I almost feel like the government. I know the. Okay, Salim, here you go. You're gonna get to hit me, but I almost feel like the government should make sure that the prices don't surge. Right? They should offset. I know people are like, we shouldn't do a bailout for the businesses, right? And they're trying to compare this to student loans, but I think this is way different than student loans. Yeah. I think that the government should steady supplies, right? Like, I think they should have a list of requirements that you should have in your house over the course of time. It should all be standardized. Um, I do think that they should create warehouses of distribution for people who need it, right? Like, take some of these a bit. Like, if I was the city right now, if I was the mayor, I would go take all the abandoned schools, and I would start preparing those abandoned schools for intake of body of people 
uh, distribution of supplies and necessities um, and then like places you can go get testing etc to keep them from going to the hospitals right and so you can go through this like you got all these schools that are already set up most of them are just shuttered you can like instead of building a new hospital in a day you could go through clean them all fix up the windows put them in and then put people in you you make them and then once you do that they're already revitalized community health centers right so you put those, you could wear, use the gyms for warehouses and food, etc. And you assuage people's concerns and you could put those fuckers in damn near all of the, un, in the in food insecure and place safe. You could have, you, your CPS could drop the kid, drop, put their food distribution there, all that. And you could bring those things back during this time. You could have people working to fix them under safe, you know, do the hazmat stuff, etc. But what happens, how do you use this crisis to, how do you use this crisis to address issues, fix stuff, and deal with things that you would not ordinarily have people's buy-in to do? So I saw, Never let a good crisis go to waste. I saw this morning, did you see the Walmart story? No. Again, and so access. Like, I'm not even, like, <clears throat> even if the government opened up stores where you could buy stuff at regular price, right? So if you are. Like a PS, like, like they have an army base. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. Where you could go get all the. Ba so you know that is there. Yeah. Like, that the feds will drop ship. To that location, I don't care if you see helicopters landing there and dropping stuff off and plats and they're taking it in. And people know that their government and the, the army, the National Guard, like you could take the National Guard and put them at all the schools. All the closed schools in the south side, barracks, military, you could do all of the stuff that you need to do, deploy Right, so you can set up your supply lines, your supply chains. I know this all sounds crazy, but again, I'm not worried about the disease as much as the response. And if you do that and people start to see that, they will take it seriously, right? They will feel some sense of order. Like, then I won't feel like I need to go buy a shotgun and save myself, right? And they become beacons of, like, you set up. Like they set up many hospitals at those places too, like Mash. You know so, what? It's the pop, the Polish population. Right. That that is gonna right. be unbelievable. So, what's gonna happen to that? Right. Especially Take, in warm climates. Mm. Mm. Hustlers. The customer. You are tuned in to the Top Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got what? my co-host, Todd Stroger. What? Did you say what a terrible song? Yes. What? Were you listening to what he was talking about? I listen to it all the time. I know the words. This is Jay-Z, man. Yeah, I, I caught that. And this I, was his return. I thought it was, uh, did, it was clever. Did you see he was... You know what he was talking about. Did, yeah, I, I always hear what he's talking about. Did you see he was rolling through... Did you see this? They was racing through Monaco. It was him, Jeff Gordon, and uh, what's the girl? What was her name? Danica Patrick. Danica Patrick. They was taking sports cars. This whole video, they racing through Monaco on the streets, man. It was great. Yeah. It, was it had epic. nothing to do with, the, uh, unless, I, uh, unless I don't know about legal. You I don't. understand what was happening. You don't. Okay. <laughs> and what were you suggesting, Todd? I was suggesting that he was saying that he come back and he and his uh, friends had just uh, made a whole bunch of money selling drugs. And they were celebrating and buying drinks for everybody. Uh, well, they, were selling, they sold a bunch of music now. It, they changed. They changed the game. See, it's like now, ten year, twenty years ago when he was singing that they probably would have been. But now it's like I've arrived. Like Joe, we doing this. We moving records. We moving Armadale. We got products. We moving all type of stuff. And it ain't the. It's like they took the game, 
legitimize. They did what the Corleones did. What the Corleones wanted to do. They took that dirty money, flipped it, and now they legit. And they putting it back in and making more millionaires. But hey, it's the top Chicago 1690 AM. And I, you know what, Todd? What? I was thinking about, as we are thinking about this uh, coronavirus, it got me to thinking about black readiness. Now this black readiness is going to have, this is a two-part conversation. The first part is about physical readiness. The second part is going to be about political readiness. Because I think that we could pay a dear political price for the way we have operated politically in a time like this, it will become apparent, right? But that's for 8 o'clock. So we're going to talk about fundraisers that can't fundraise, consultants that can't consult. That We're going to talk about all of that because it leaves us woefully underprepared in a time where we are going to be fighting for resources, Politically as well as economically. But I'm going to take a step back because I said I was going to start with economics. Okay. Todd, you know, when you turn on the when you turn on Facebook, there is any number of social media pundits and and social media activists and real time activists that um, will call every black person out every they will call you Uncle Tom Sambo uh, they if you say you for this or that they will be like you a sellout to the black community they are ready for the revolution yeah and all you 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 house Negroes who is who voted for somebody that they disagree with are just Uncle Tom slave stuck on the plantation pretty much I mean it's a lot of people that have built their brand around that. Yeah. A lot of people that built their brand around that are right now the same people that will be reliant upon the people that they talk about. Not the black people, but the government that they talk about for their subsistence. Like, I always talk about when people tell me they want a revolution. I always say, well, you're going to have to get the, you're going to have to get you a farm before you, you go to the revolution. Can I tell you, I've been to. Yes, you have to be able to feed yourself. I went to a revolutionary, a country where there was a revolution. Uh huh. Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, and you know who were the most important people in the army? You know how the general won? Because the general had a whole agricultural department, and he could always feed his soldiers, always. Even when everybody else was in the midst of famine, you showed up to the general crib, they had corn, cow, they had everything. You, you know the saying, an army moves on its stomach. So, right now, how... For all of our name calling, Uncle Tom calling, saying we own the house, Negroes on the plantation, brothers, what's the plan? Like, what, 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 what we got? Can we come to y'all farm and pick some corn or cotton and hay? I'm just, I'm, I'm just asking for the armchair revolutionaries. Well, you know what I say, Maze. What do you say, Todd? That. Uh Let's see, well, I'm 57 now, so I'd say in the last uh, 30 plus years, I haven't seen much change in our, our areas when it comes to politics and fighting each other. We still fight each other, uh, and there's a group that thinks that there's always a group that thinks that they're woker than the other group, and then there's always a group on the other side that thinks that they are working within the system, but they rarely seem to ever get together. Who is woke right now? Let me ask the question. So for the rep, for the re, for the rebels and the and the, the name callers and the people that have been on the front lines, what you built? What you got? We coming to hide up under your tent? I see. I I think right now, right now we are in the midst of my point when we talk about these revolutions, when we talk about working inside and outside of the system. See, Todd, right now, if the A Arabs in our neighborhood decide, right, that they want a price gouge, guess what? They can because it ain't their community. Now, we got Kwame Raul who is out, and shout out to the ah, yeah, Attorney General who's jumped up on this. But we're jumping up, complaining, asking someone else to save us in our own neighborhoods. So the, the Arab Corner store that's in, in our neighborhood felt comfortable enough to charge black folks $80 for some toilet paper. Hmm. 
Just think about that. Se seniors, all of us. What do we have right now in the space of wealth creation? Like, who do we go to right now in our own community? Like, who are the multimillionaires and billionaires or people that have the wealth that can start to help to protect our community in the case of a trial or trouble. Who can we rely on with econ with money and resources? Because you know we spent... Let me tell you what's happening in white communities. I was watching the news yesterday and white people were building um, school boxes, mailboxes, in which they were depositing food. Like one, during this crisis... This guy was building mailboxes and distributing to all of the neighbors in his white community. And everybody walked by and if you had some extra food, you left it in the box. And somebody could pick it up and somebody could take it away. Right? Oh, you know what that's like? It was like the books. Yeah, yeah. He took the book process and did it. But they didn't say, hey, who's coming to save us? Right. Guess what he did? And they all decided in their own town collectively. Right? Right? That they were going to start to take care of each other. Now you know how you do that? When you got some economy. When your whole economy is not built on subsistence. So here's the thing. White folks right now. The politicians will tell them. You all we done stacked y'all up. So y'all got to survive on your own for a minute. Now most of y'all are employed. Y'all got jobs. So you got a little savings. You're going to put you up. You're going to. And. Then when government needs to assist and supplement, we can assist and supplement you. For black, a lot of black communities, we're not going to be supplemented by the government. We are going to subsist on the government. Hmm. Because we have not focused on building wealth and businesses in our community that we could rely on. So right now, we got to call our attorney general. Because the Arab guy in our neighborhood sees us as a profit and sees the opportunity to make a profit. His compassion is not there for your child. His compassion is, man, we got these Negroes so we can feed our kids in Palos. You see how this cycle, like right, right now, so for all the people right now, what are the black resources? What do we have, Todd? And are we really ready? And is this teaching our revolutionaries who busy calling each other Uncle Toms? And Uncle Tom is a misnomer, by the way. Right. Because he was a hero. Um, but, you know, you have to read to understand it. Um, Todd, what do we have that we can rely on right now? Who and what in the black community, if this thing go, if they start cutting off resources? Well, you know what our, our problem uh, generally has been? Uh, is that because uh, we've had people who've had stores, uh, but you know it's hard to have a you know like two stores and really be able to compete price-wise and things of that nature. Uh, since we aren't able to break into other neighborhoods and expand, it's it's hard to keep these things living. I'm gonna tell you what the 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 Arabs Arab corner stores right now, they got warehouses full of food that they gonna sell us at way high exorbitant prices and they gonna go somewhere else and buy and double they gonna make a profit on our pain and misery as I tell you happens all the time the pain and suffering of black people is profit for other communities we'll be back after talk traffic in the weather more of the morning show with Mays Jackson coming you got the camera oh Dr. Stay I always say the same stuff. It's really people putting their money together. I mean, when you think of these people who became big time uh, millionaires and such, you know, back in the uh, 70s, 80s, they worked somewhere, they had an idea, and then they, you know, they did something about it. I mean, I'm talking like, you know, in that kind of ebony jet, soft sheen, you know, that kind of stuff. But as I've always said, we are already always capital poor. Our, our uh, 
I don't think we really supported our banks the way we uh, needed to. You know, uh, Independence and uh, Seaway, and I'm forgetting somebody, uh, Highland. You know, their assets were never really high enough for them, for them to really be a big player in a bigger game. Uh, I don't know. You know, they depended on things like, you know, churches for, for deposits, which is not a very uh, sustainable thing because churches tended to go up and down depending on who the, who the pastor was at the time. So... Until we realize that, you know, even though I'm working hard, I'm doing this and, and this job, and I'm working for somebody, you got to pay yourself first. And then after you pay yourself, and, you know, time is always a factor in this, it's going to take some years, you get together with some other group, with some other people, and you form a group, and that group can do things. Uh, I'll, I got to hand it to, like, some of the police officers who own the motels before they sold them off but they got together they put their money to use and they created the hotel system um, from there they, they made some real money but we don't we just don't have enough of that I have to work in a in a group effort it's 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 hard to do anything off of one person's salary and their and their credit you know we need more collaboration. I think I talked to, to my friends just the other, I think it was last year. I was like, hey, you know what? Why don't you all start saving some money we'll buy some real estate? I said, I'm going to be trying to save money even though I don't make as much as you guys anymore. <laughs> Me off my feet. Gonna be my so sweet. You are tuned in to Top Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host to our Stroger Todd talking about readiness. Are we really ready? I told you yesterday I went to Pete's on yes. my in the West Side. And a fight broke out, and the security was fighting a gentleman with a long extended heavy wrench. And it went on for about 15 minutes, and three police officers zipped by, and nobody stopped. And everybody was like, Police, the police, where's the police? And Did they, anybody know what the fight was about? Uh, I assumed it was about theft, yes, yeah, uh, right. theft because the security came running out the store. Um, and it was like a big chase and the whole thing, but everybody was screaming for the police, and I was thinking like, "Wow, what happens when you the come police?" From a good neighborhood now. Well, sort of. I live on the line, ah. right? Like one side, it's like I, my line is like Oakley is like the line. Uh huh. So if you're on one side of Oakley, you're in a good space. I'm on the good side of Oakley. Right. But once you cross the other side, you, you get a mix. Rough. You get a mix. Uh -huh. It's like the convergence. Oh, oh, yeah, they're still working on it. Right, 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 right. We made it to Western. Like, the houses have gone up, but the people haven't moved yet. Yeah. So it's it's a whole bunch of things. Um, but Todd... Or the attitude hasn't changed. Yeah. That's what I always say. It's, it's more of the attitude of people than anything else. So my question is, but there was no police, and I was thinking about what happens when there's no response from government. What do black people have? Who can we rely on? Let's go to the phone lines. Miss yeah. Joanne, you on the Talk Chicago, 1690. Yes, good God morning. Good, good morning. morning. I, uh, I, uh, I made the comment to the young lady that put me on hold. That's why the Panthers were such a threat. Because they had a vision. Because even to this day, children are receiving free breakfast because of their programs. They was into helping people wholly and completely and what do we have we have time just like doing this crisis right here we need to start in our household if you have to work different shifts if you have to start becoming self-employed you need to start working in your own household because i have told people i am a certified literacy tutor by the state of illinois if they want me to start homeschooling their children i will 
Thank you, Joanne. We're going to get... Now, I'm going to tell you, because at a certain point, and as a matter of fact, Joanne, why don't you write your information down? Because I think I want to also start talking about resources. I want to start creating a black resource list. Tennille and the Mom Squad have done it, but I want to make sure, like in this time, because I don't think we have resources, right? Like, I got to get my man, Mike Brown, to start getting them concealed carry classes. And we got... I mean, I just feel like we got to make sure we got a plan for our community. Let's go to Shim. Shim, you on the Talk of Chicago, 1690. All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think that uh, you asked them about the revolutionaries. The sister was right. The Panthers, they were, they were revolutionaries. Where my thing is, where the fathers with Jay-Z and all these billionaires, Oprah, they are the ones who have the resources to have for them and things for their people. Well, we don't think collectively. But one thing about right now, everything is on schedule. From 1619 to 2019, everybody debating or whatever, we see it now because we actually are still in 2019 because the 2020 don't start until March in about a couple weeks. So everything is on par. That the so-called black man in America is going to be resurrected, just like what happened in Egypt in the plague sector. That's just what's going on. And we should be saved. And all the floating Christianity and uh, tied to the, uh, what he is, all the, everybody put your spirit in your souls and all your beliefs and all your talk and all the games, it's over with. Shalom, shalom, shalom. One love. Thank you, Shem. That sounds like Jacob. I bet you, though. I bet you, though, that, that he also sounds like a Hebrew Israelite. Mm-hmm. I bet he is a Hebrew Israelite. Respect. Let me go to Ralph. Ralph, you're on the top of Chicago, 1690. Good morning, May. Good morning, Ralph. The thing about uh, kicking us when we're down, throwing salt in the wound. Uh, I was on uh, 46th and Cottage yesterday by the Walmart Express. And uh, last, the uh, parking enforcement was vigorously issuing tickets. Wait, wait, wait. No, you were. No, I, no, I don't believe you. Like no, me, Ralph, I don't believe you. Okay. No. Maybe I no, no, no. I'm being, I'm being silly. I'm being, no, I'm being silly. 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 i uh, we're in this crisis right now. There's overflow parking, and there's uh, the meter boxes. And there was two uh, young people uh, taking the, uh, you know, they had an automated process of, uh, they take a picture of your license plate. And they was writing tickets on 46 in Cottage Grove. Hey, y'all better talk to the mayor about that tomorrow when she come in here. Let me go to Sister Zakia. Sister Zakia, you're on Talk Chicago. Yes, good morning, Mayor Todd. Good morning. Listen, Joanne and I are on the same page this morning. Uh, I'm an elder, and uh, she might be uh, elder, uh, going into an elder stage. But it seems like there is something we can do from the home. If someone could put a program together, some smart person like you and Todd, maybe we can work in conjunction with our aldermen or our state rep or our congressman and do some work on our phone or on our computers from the house those of us that can't go out because i don't want nobody coming around me from outside so uh there i just feel like i need to be doing something because see whenever there's a tragedy i'm always working to help the cause, and and I can't help. Yes, you can. Yes, you can, sister. You know what, sister Zakia? Yes, you can. And, and I'm gonna pause right there because I'm gonna tell you, I need to get together with some of the educators, some of the business people. Some we need to create our own channel during this time, right? You know, like a channel where you could do lessons. Like we could literally use social media. You could literally film teachers teaching a classroom every day. And teaching third, fourth, fifth grade lessons. And you could have those. And they these kids could watch it on their phone. They could put it on their TV. I really think that over this time, black folks, we've got to be innovative. I hear people saying they're upset because they got to teach their own kids. Your own kids is your responsibility. Mm-hmm. And in this time and in this place, we have to grab our own kids and make sure that they don't lose. Y'all think these white folks going to let their kids lose during this time? No. People talking about, I got to take care of my kids. You got, that's right. But we got to take care of our own kids. You know, we need a video network. A video network 
where if you got a third grader, a fourth grader, you want entertainment, you know what? I think it's time for the Black the Black News Network top. Yeah. I think I'm going to officially. I, look, I'm going to be cut. the worst thing that happened to BET? Yep. Did they stopped talking about us. They stopped talking about us, and I'm thinking that we can use social media and Facebook Live over this time to rebuild a black communications network with content sharing partners and people saying, hey, let's take this. Let's Look, there's all these people that got all these media outlets. Y'all know we could create 24 hours worth of programming if we could put everybody together and really inform, entertain, and control our own community while everybody's sitting in the house. Man, I'm going to be on a documentary one day. As your sad cake. <laughs> yes, when Mace became a billionaire, I became a thousandaire. Thank you, Mace. <laughs> hey, y'all, when we come back, I want to talk about fundraisers who can't fundraise. It's, it's the top of Chicago. Why are you laughing, Todd? It's not funny. It's where, it's where we are, though. We'll talk about it all when we come back. That's an oxymoron. Sarah's Yeah, I would like to broadcast home schools. Like, I would love to go get a bunch of content people. Say, hey, we're going to show you how to set up your own home studio. We're coming to you live at 3 o'clock. So whether you're reading, whether you're teaching, whether whatever it is, but creating a network of where black people, Tanil, get on it. So if there is martial law, where do we go? Like... Find like the intro, find the warriors. I don't care which one you use, but I want that lady talking. Hey, boppers and boppets, we are looking. So find whatever, somewhere she's talking extensively, like in, in an intro or something. Because again, that was the same thing I'm talking about. Where black, even if you knew at seven o'clock every day there's gonna be a black address. Like I think that the black legislators can I get some John Griffin? Can I get AGB to support my network? Right? We can run y'all commercials and stuff in there, but I'm saying, like, can we do 24 hours worth of program? Can we find 24 people that want to do an hour a day? Well, take away three because you're going to get the morning show. Okay. Right? I think people need video. So I think, like all the content generators, we all need to get together and have a verbal, a social meeting. Um, but John, even with you and the security, right? We need to get you. I know y'all don't want to, but Kate, all of those things, y'all need to be able to respond for when people need help. Like, who is AGB? You got people all over the city in these SSAs. But who is, how do we contact and make sure that we're policing our own communities? Right? Like, y'all, we got to put together the network right now. I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, like, guys, let's be innovative. It's times like this, like, let's beat the drum. Oop, did I say the drum? Sister Zakia, you gonna do some um we gonna have you teaching some lessons. Like think about it, we could do hygiene, we could do all type of lessons. You could literally program. Think about if you could get intellectual, butt naked, and WVON together. Just think if the haters could stop hating for a minute and say, This is our opportunity to mobilize black people and at the end of this we got a whole network of black people looking and saying this is what we're gonna do politically. I don't think you're against it. I don't think anybody's against it. I'm just talking smacking a little bit. But it's like, I do. I think like, we got black, we got our own security forces that are in existence, even if the seniors have a number to call when something bad is happening, right? Like yesterday, 
that thing could have turned out bad, mm-hmm. right? I wasn't finna jump in the middle of it. But I do think if we knew that the police weren't going to come and we could have called AGB and they could have pulled up, like, y'all got a fleet. It's like we could... We could bend out, build our own. This is an opportunity for us to rebuild our own political infrastructure all the way around. I'm going to talk about it too. Because they've been giving us, like right now in times of need, we need strong leaders that are willing to go get the resources. Right now what they have done is put all of, they have given us all hunters, not hunters, they got hunters and warriors. We got agricultural people. And all of the people that we had in the fight, they have domesticated them. Right? True. So, like, I'm I'm considered a wild animal because I have not been domesticated. Our political people have pretty much been been domesticated. And in being domesticated, it's like we're about to be in a time of war for resources. Now I know, like all the white folks are going to be like they your friends, but whatever they can get for their communities, they're going to be trying to get it legislatively, however they can get it. Like them people that you like, all oh, they cool with, they, they going to be trying to cut you out. Todd, do you think there'll be a, a, a battle of resources for resources when they start talking about the stimulus, what, what they're going to do to recover the business, recover, and what will happen is the white liberals will have convinced us that we got to do everything to save EJ, the white bar owners, et cetera, and there will be nothing for us and yeah, our people that got think, decimated. I don't know if it's going to be much of a battle. We don't seem to have to, uh, well, like you, like you uh, said in the past, we uh, we try to get on the train while it's already moving. So right now, we should be tooling up for war, legislatively, economically, like we should be drawing up our own stimulus plan for what's going to help the black community recover. Because guess what? Everybody else is going to get something. The restaurants, all of them people, they're going to get something to help them recover. We're not a good thing for our research uh, arm. Excuse me. Maze, you can, uh, if you want to start that resource thing, you can start it on Bond TV. No, I forgot. I forgot we got TV, too. Because it's, I mean, it's all, I think it's up and running. No, not yet. No. But um, talk to Melody and ask her when, you know, it's going to be up. And she probably would think that's a really good idea in terms of uh, television, you know, just different programming for different things. Cool. Maze, let's knock this out here real quick. Woman up. I'm done with it. Go to the bank, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> that what? sounds dangerous. What's that? That sounds dangerous. Not for a white guy. If I walked into the bank like that, get shot. I'd get shot. <laughs> Rise and shine. What, Tanil? What I do, Tanil? We um. Tears are crying. So much pain inside. Tell it's over. So many tears are crying to keep the love alive. Mm-hmm. 
Baby, it ain't over till it's over. You are tuned in to the Talk Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host, Todd Stroger. Hey, man. Hey, I got a, I got a, it, a squirrel. Well, before you get the squirrel, let me do this. Let me say oh, what's boy. up to Todd Stroger, Jennifer Thompson in the newsroom, as well as Miss Sonia Escobar. Now, Todd, squirrels? So, car wash was on. Working at the car wash. Whoa, 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 car wash, yeah. And you know, there's the, 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 older, that? Black guy. <laughs> <laughs> the older black guy. The older black guy who tries to keep the things, yeah. you know. Uh-huh. And I didn't realize. Why you gonna rob this girl, this store, man? That's, yeah, that's actually the part I actually saw and saw in the end. <laughs> okay. I didn't realize that that's the guy from uh, Hogan's Heroes. I would never guess. I looked at him and He like, gained Whoa. a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> You want to talk about a squirrel. Well, you know what, though? And he also was a director, and he directed uh, the spook who sat behind the door. Oh, sat by the door, not behind the door. Yeah, yeah right. Spook who sat behind, behind the door. The door. Right, <laughs> getting, getting hit in the head like, oh, <laughs> dang, oops. Dang, oops. <laughs> what are you doing behind that door, spook? <laughs> you spook. Okay, uh, Todd, yeah, um, yeah I'm going to tell you. Well, it's funny you were mentioning Hogan's Heroes. Uh, I was gonna say, who in the heck cares about Hogan's Heroes? But if can you imagine if you do not have Netflix right now or any of those things, you are watching all the reruns, all the reruns. Yes. Uh, now, do you think can we get a, a, a can we get the ban on the Cosby Show lifted? Oh no, it, it still comes on one of these stations. I can't yeah, remember. I'm talking about can we make it like worldwide again, just so we can remember the good old days. Hey y'all, it's the Talk of Chicago 1690. It's sports I'm missing. You know I'm missing Show sports. Show me some old Bulls games. I don't even need to see the championship title in the championship. Just some old games. Well, games. they're going to start doing That'd it. That'd be cool. They're going to start doing it. Because they really have it. Hey, like, trying to watch ESPN is crazy. But let me do this. Because, Todd, before we do this, yes. speaking of sports, maybe you can guess who the beautiful black woman of the day is. Yeah, War. Uh, you know what, <laughs> This is your problem. Pay attention. All right. Now, she was born December 21st, 1959 in Los right. Angeles, That's California. 59. Um, and then she died September 21st, 1998 what? in Mission Viejo, California. Now, she attended California State, Northridge, and the University of California, Los Angeles. She was most known as an Olympic gold medalist that brought style to track and field. Boy, when she put that bodysuit on, I was like, <laughs> good Lord! Uh-huh. I sure would love to catch you. Uh, but suspicions, she was known as the world's fastest woman. But suspicions came about uh, when people started to ask, was her and her husband... Uh, taking performance hence enhancing drugs. She was repeatedly testing during during the competition and she always passed the test. Epilepsy eventually caused her sudden death. Now some of her major accomplishments include she won world records in the 100 and 200 meter dash. She was inducted into the track and field hall of fame. Uh, her artistic talents could be seen when she was competing on the track she had them nails, and I think she might have been the original weave. Could you imagine if she didn't have all that weave? How much more time? Because that was probably some I was drag. Those nails and those, the weave probably slowed her down. Wind drag. Uh, she persuaded uh, members of the track team to wear uh, tights with their uniforms. And beyond her running prowess, she was known for her bold fashion choices. Now, Todd, if you can't get this one, your black card is taken. Can you Flo guess who? Joe. Flo Joe. Florence Griffin. Joint. Man, I show love. And her husband was on me. Say, look. Yeah, uh, yep. Jackie, jo- uh, Kersey, uh, well, Joint. Hold on, bro. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. She wasn't, uh, she was, all oh, right, right. She was right. on the other. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, she was on the same Her side. husband, <laughs> what, what was his name? Al, uh, jo- Al. Al Joyner? Yeah. Right, 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 right. He came up, and then his sister was Jackie Joyner Kersey. Yes. Right. They was from East St. The Boogie. But j- did, so, could you imagine when Flo Jo showed up in the Boogie, though? I mean, because you, as long as she didn't go over there by that street. Because that one street in East St. Louis, whoop, <laughs> Lord have mercy. It's one street where you be like, am I old enough for this? Hey, y'all, it is. She is Flo Jo. I was super proud of her. Yes. Okay, Todd, um, I'm going to talk about something that is a, it's a, I'm, I'm particularly sensitive about this subject. Todd, I am, 
I know that I have evolved over time, but I really took my political training seriously. Like paying dues in politics. Yeah. I remember when I first got in politics with my man and I couldn't go to the meetings and then I would I remember going to get him coffee, right? Here I am, I got a a multi hundred thousand dollar business, but I wanted to be involved in politics and so to be involved in politics back then, uh, you didn't start at the top. You had to grind. Like right. you came in, nobody. Who you come? Who you? Who are you? Hi, right, I need you to go work these ten precincts. I need you to go put up this many and knock this many doors and all. And then there was a process time mm-hmm. to becoming a political operative. It wasn't a title that you just got because you were on Facebook. It wasn't a title because of your your persuasion or your adjective in front of your name. It was, when you were a young Democrat or you were a member of the Young Democrats, it was the political training ground. i never forget going to um, the Young Democrat reunion that happened at the big bar at the Hyatt. Now, you were the president at the time, but you was too busy, I think. Uh, it was organized by Alderman Burnett. I think Marlo was there. And a whole bunch of Young Democrats that were there mm. during from your era. Oh, okay. Right? And it was just... Also, you know, I'm like a political junkie, so I'm listening to the stories. I'm listening to Alderman Burnett and Marlo and them. They talking about how they had to be grunts. And, you know, I'm looking at them, and these guys are like big state reps and aldermen. I'm like, man, one day. And, you know, I would listen to them talk, but I wouldn't be interjecting because I didn't have the chops at the time. Right. And so you're like, one day, and you looked around, and all those guys were like, if they weren't elected, they were some big government affairs person. But that was You could see the progression from being in the organization to being a young Democrat that even with people you were at war with as young Democrats, you built a political camaraderie so that when it was time for you to ascend to your position or station in life, whether it was a lobbyist, whether it was a political elected official, whatever it was, your core group of people that you learned the game with were there to support you, were there to help you into your space. Now, it made it work a little different for you, Todd. No, actually, there was uh, about three or four people from the Young Democrats who worked for me when I was at the county. Got it. It probably would have been more, except, you know, I was still tied to a lot of people when I got there. Right, because you came from the 8th Ward. There was a right. progression. Uh, Todd, it seems to me that we have, our political operatives have been domesticated. And they are no longer political warriors. They are really political caretakers. And I... So they're like um, uh, the toy dogs? They're innocuous. They're in the... Uh Yes. They get to take all the good pictures. They look great in pictures. They do all the selfies. But when it's time to go to war, they can't bite. Right. So when we come back, I want to talk about what happened to the black political bench and why it's so important that we fix it now as we go into this this un, uncharted territories in the world that we live in now. Fundraising and can't fundraise, consulting but can't consult. It seems like we live in a microwave generation, and that microwave gener- political generation is going to be the f- could be our demise if we don't stop it now. Let's talk Chicago 1690. More of the morning show with Mays Jackson coming up on the Talk of Chicago 1690. So, Hi. Think about this. When we were young Democrats, all of the all of the people that were staffers knew that they were staffers. They and and you like even if you worked and you had a high position, you knew where you fit in the game. Right. I was at an event last summer where a young Democrat had the audacity to question a sitting elected official that we both know as to whether she was actually a chemist. This is a young Democrat. Mm. Is at a, at a public event with other elected officials and who's who? Talking about, have we really seen her chemistry degree? Think about the gravity of that. Just think about the gravity of that 
and just the lack of respect. Now, let, let me go yeah. back. I need to get this back from you today. What? What is the it? The thing that I asked you to sign last week. Oh, okay. No, you didn't ask me to sign it last week. You asked me to sign it on Tuesday. Was it Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's all put together. Gotcha. You know. um, there was a time, like, when What's In It For The Black People came about, and we started asking the question, you know what happened? The party had a snapshot reaction. So, in Springfield... Monique Davis's uh, grandson became an uber lobbyist instantly. Because I used to be like, there's no black lobbyists. Yeah. Right? So he all of a sudden, and he's on the magic lobbyist list, right? Because remember when McLean was like, what have we done for black people? Mm -hmm. Right? So I used to complain. So Javon becomes the uber lobbyist. Remember I'm talking about the fundraising. All of a sudden, uh, Craddock and Schaefer become the Uber fundraising group because now Karen is putting them on all type of stuff and now they're raising all the funds for all these people. Then um, there's other people, right? There were people who came from me who I put on campaigns who then without really having re they, they became outreach and all that. But anyway, my point being we have a group of people now who have been elevated to titles that have stature or status or mean something in the political world or in the old political world, but they've done nothing to prove it. They've done nothing to, so if you're fundraising for, for JB, he didn't do no fundraising. If he pies you to do outreach, you ain't strategy, you outreach. You show up and you take the pictures. Right. But these are the people that have been elevated to the highest spots in our infrastructure. So what we got is when it's time to go to war, as Tony Preckwinkle found out, and she only won 20 precincts because she ain't got no real warriors. Yeah, they have no practical experience. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> I keep telling you, people be changing the argument to make sure it fits they, they <laughs> You are tuned in to the Talk Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Mays Jackson. Got my co-host, Todd Stroger. Todd, I was talking about before we went to break. There used to be honor and dignity in being a political operative. You know, Jay-Z has a line in the song that says, you, uh, it's, it's, and he got a song called Where I'm From. And it's, you couldn't talk about it if you ain't live it, yeah. right? And it's like, what we have right now in the black space is a lot of people have been elevated to slots. And I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of people got elevated to slots because of what's in it for the black people. But here's what happens. What happens is the white folks don't want to put strong black people in powerful positions because they might get the idea that hey you know what they don't want to have happen again Todd what? and I think I think I may have made a mistake I may have made a mistake because when I got to the spot and saw what was going on instead of just being quiet and taking my check I was like oh <laughs> these white people around here making all this money and they playing all y'all and essentially what happened was, remember when we saw those emails from the speaker and Mike McClain, or from Mike McClain going to the speaker and, to, and they were basically saying, uh, we're trying to get these people to control Maze, but since we can't, mm -hmm. could you please tell us what we've done for black people? And so let me just tell you, Todd, there was a mad scramble. There's a lot of people right now that would not be who they are politically if it was not for the threat of what's in it for the black people. No, I, I, I totally understand. Because uh, when the first black lobbyist popped up, it was because the black caucus started making noise, and you know, you know who they can affect the most, and that's generally like the utilities. Right. So they're the first people who respond, and they hire people, and, and they had long careers. But what's important for the party is to hire the people that aren't going to make trouble. And when when we talk about making trouble, we talk about people who might 
start rabble rousing, might start asking questions like, what's in it for the black people? And so what happens is, Todd, they elevate, an, they elevate domesticated black people who are happy taking pictures and not ready to go to political war. And essentially what happens is our ranks in the political space get filled with kitty cats instead of bulldogs. Well, <clears throat> am know, I crazy? No, well, you know, part of the problem is it's because they get to decide who gets what, you become part of their team. Now, you're not a, a major league player, you know, you're, you're in the Bush leagues, at least, it, that's how you're getting paid, but you're still part of their team, and you know that if you step out of line, you will be cut. So most people don't want to make too much noise. Well, I'm going to tell you, I know what it's like to be cut. I know exactly what it's like to be cut. And it's funny because even when you take the cut, you get whooped by the black people who outside say, you did the bit, it is a bit. And then the black people inside be like, um... The black people inside feel like it's their job to prove to the white folks that they can cut you down. So the domesticated well, the, the domesticated animals, instead of recognizing that they are there because you offset what I would be talking about or what we would be talking about, they feel like they're special, they're smart. They're, and what happens is the white folks be like, ooh, you special, you go take the check. You get to show up with the check. Now, I'm going to tell you how much the check going to be. Mm -hmm. But you get to take the check, and now you get to be the important person. And the white folks got you feeling, but when it's time to go to war, guess what the white folks know? Oh, we ain't got, we ain't got to worry about him. Nope. We ain't got to worry about her, because they can't do nothing. They ain't never really fought no battles. It's so funny to me, because I look at a lot of the white guys and a lot of the black people at the same levels. And I think about the steps that the white guys had to go to to get to the level. And I think about the black people that are at those same levels. And usually the black people get picked because they don't want no trouble. Right. The white boys got to climb. Well, you know, I, 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 I always say that you know, well, at least I knew, that we were in trouble when I found out that the, as I'll call them, the top black lobbyist gets cut and the black legislators don't stand up and say, no, no, that's not going to happen. You, nobody elected you to do nothing. He's going to stay doing this kind of stuff. No, the black people get in line and be like, is that what we're going to do? Is he out now? Instead <laughs> of, and then they get on the whooping stick. And, and, and so I'm going to tell you, Todd, I felt some kind of way. I was just watching. I was watching a particular race. And because, you know, after so after JB won, there was a whole crew of black communications people that didn't have a communicate. Don't know nobody in the press. There was a whole bunch of fundraisers who didn't never raise no funds unless it was the candidate already had the money. Couldn't go find no new money. You had uh, political consultants who were consulting, but they got hired because they knew people, but they didn't know any strategy. Mm -hmm. So. I remember after Tony Preckwinkle lost, because there was a lot of people in the Tony Preckwinkle camp that used to talk just mad smack to me. Just yeah, like, uh -huh. right, they would be like, you ain't, and then when they was on the Madigan team or whatever, they would be like, they felt like, like, Negro, you didn't do nothing. Be clear. If it was just me and you, your ass would be whooped. It is the whole world. But it, I remember after the Tony Preckwinkle campaign, just pointing out to some of the people, and they was like, well, she was just a bad candidate. Now, mind you, mind you, you was down with her, and you been down, and that was the bully sticking. You was holding the stand, but then she was a bad candidate. But, Ty, what happens when the fundraiser, when it ain't nobody in the mix but you and your people, and the fundraiser can't fundraise, mm -hmm. and, the, and the consultant can't consult, and the strategists don't know no strategy? See? You know, the problem, Maze, is, is when you come from a place... You always are from that place. So even as you are working, so let's say uh, they're like, well, you got to tell them this. Well, what you do is you go to say the elected official and say, look, I, I got to tell you this, but you know what? If you do this and get together and do this or push this button, then they're going to have to tell me something different. But see, here's what you got. You got a bunch of political nomads who have no political pedigree. 
no political pedigree, so they don't come from nowhere. So they have no loyalty because they ain't never been a part of nothing. Think about it. Like they don't, the people who get the opportunities oftentimes don't come from an organization because the organ, you would be loyal to the organization. Right? So what you do is you find same. So when, when the Democratic Party went from political operatives that had been young Democrats to political operatives that were young Dems that weren't from anywhere, that were now progressive, that labeled themselves as black progressives. Right. Black people were officially out of the game. Hmm. And it's like I told you before, when the progressives took over the machine that they were trying to break for the last 20 years, the people that they put in were broken parts. And those broken parts are the parts that then get resold into our community. And we all like the pictures and take the tabs and do all of that good stuff, right? Right? They take all the pictures, but when it's time to get out and knock on the door and it's time to get off of Facebook, right? right? Because all your friends like you on Facebook. No political background, no chops. You get elevated. But now it's like these are the people that are in the positions of power for our future. That's crazy. We'll be back after traffic in the weather. Exactly. Yeah. Live from the WBON. Howard was running and it looked like he had a challenge. I was out of I was like 54, 55. I had a bad hip. Then I got up and walked them streets. And let, me, and let me tell you, it hurt too. Right. <laughs> it literally it was painful. But Think it, about real precinct captains be like, man, I can't miss election day. No. Or not even, but real political operatives. It's so funny to me because it's like, if you talk to a white polit, I got a lot of people that I talk to politically. There are a lot of white guys that I say have ascended, but can I tell you what? With the speaker, you can't ascend without knowing what it is because they need you to be, they always are replenishing the stock. Mm -hmm. Right? They always like, man, we gonna make somebody else rich. So you, we go, who gonna be next? They fill their ranks up. They teach their guys how to win on our people. Right? So when such and such and such and such need a campaign manager, Madigan will send you one of his and he'll train his guy on you. Right. And that guy don't get to go home till 10 o'clock at night and he's the first person there, etc. These niggas are happy just walking around taking selfies and pictures. They don't know shit else to do. They don't know shit else to do. And it's like, come on, man. Come on. And it's like, it's like, dog, I'm, I'm just, it's like, and our, right now, we are at a critical point. We need warriors. We don't need motherfuckers who are trying to be still, Madigan is falling apart right now. Oh yeah, I mean he's falling apart, and we still got niggas that are still trying to line up over there and be on that team instead of trying to dig their own. Instead of trying to make your own fucking way. Yeah. And then people like you wrong. No nah, man, I'm tired. It's like in these mugs and these mugs who ain't never had no experience. Let me tell you what. Talk shit about Chester. Talk shit about a lot of people. Like usually at political events, it would happen like this. The politicians would go that way. Their operatives would go this way. <laughs> we would all talk shit. So even when I lost on the um, Ken Duncan race, uh -huh. and they was like, we kicked your ass, it was like I had to take that. Mm -hmm. Because we've been in wars before. I kicked their ass when it was Paul Stewart. Mm -hmm. Right? But to have some motherfucker who ain't never, ever, not one time ever had to go outside Nigga, you got a, a charter. You started, I thought you was from here. You got a charter from over here. And then when your person get in trouble, you don't even help your person. Hmm. Like, if if my charter came from Carrie Austin, you can best believe I'm going to make sure she got signatures. Oh, exactly. It's like, we are about to go into war for resources with these kids remind me of college educated lieutenants who have never been to war trying to tell battle scarred soldiers what to do right I 
I just I'm I'm and it's like I'm t it's like we got all these look Joe all these mugs been taking selfies since Ken what have they built what what have we built under so all the black power we got what kind of organization exists like let me get out the way take me out the game the highest ranking person do we have do we have a battle infrastructure right now that says we can go into a ward and take it? A district and take it? No. And guess what? The mugs that they're going to rely on to take it are the, are the same ones bu busy saying, don't let them come over here because if they come over here, then it's going to prove how much shit we don't know. Hmm. Really? Because every time you say, hey, did you do this? They're like, what? Oh, I didn't think of that. I mean, seriously, you think about how much shit people were talking about Tony Preckwinkle's campaign when she launched. Yeah. I mean, they was swaggerific talking shit, what they going to do, and when they was mayor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as she started to fall, they didn't even know what the fuck to do. Well, well was... they didn't they didn't have a plan. They just knew to go around in circles and show up at the churches and wait. They didn't say, okay, what's our ground game? They probably talk about ground game. They couldn't tell you how many pluses they got, how many minuses they got. The only people, the big, the most powerful entity in the black community right now is the unions. And on the black side is SEIU. On the white side is the skilled trade unions. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, with CTA, CTU, not CTA. Like, think about this. Vic and them got enough organization that they went and took the damn, they went and took Iris Martinez. They took, so now they got a whole nother power base. Well, they, they, they had a, a, a plan, and, and they worked it well. Right. But I'm just saying, like, who we got like that? Yeah. Well. I mean, we do, but the people that know how to do it, well, I, I'm not even saying it's a lot of people like that, because I'm just telling you, haven't worked on a lot of campaigns, most of the niggas I've seen on campaigns be like, how do I get that street money? Nobody's usually in the... You are tuned in to Top Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host, Ty Stroger. Ty, what happens? You know about those days I like? What? Is that I could go to a movie and not know what it was. What you mean? Like, I didn't really know anything about Star Wars when I saw it. This is from Star Wars? Yeah. Duh, 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 duh. Oh, yeah, it is from the cantina scene. Wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no. People is talking crazy. Hey, man, Star Wars, I didn't remember wanting to go see Star Wars. I just remember being there. You yeah. know why I remember Star Wars? Because my Aunt Joan took me. I went to see it in Muncie, Indiana. That's funny, because I, I saw it in Lake Geneva with my cousin. See, and I saw it in, in I saw it with my cousin Stacy, and we went to go see it, and I remember being like, what is this? And then, it was a, then I saw the a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and I was stuck ever since that point. Yeah. Right? And I wanted a lightsaber and go, zoom, right. Make noise while I move. And then I wanted to be like, <laughs> Star Wars, man, it was. And then remember when the Empire Strikes Back came out? Yes. Woo! And what was the other one? The three. It was Empire Strikes Back, uh, Return, Return of the Jedi. Jedi. Yep. Luke, I am your father. He's like, that's your daddy. <laughs> oh, Luke, you know your daddy. Now you were young because that was nobody's secret. By the time that was Empire Strikes Back, by that time everybody knew. By the time the movie came out, everybody knew. Ah, okay, okay. All right, y'all. Talk Chicago, sixteen ninety a.m. In a minute, we're gonna talk about uh, social distancing influence. But I just talk. What do we do? Like, I feel like most of our people don't know that they're being 
frauded? Like, I think that... Well, I will say, because, you know, as when you told me about all that kind of money that was flying around, I had no idea there was that kind of money that was... Man, JB paid. was paying mugs like $13,000 a month per person. Yeah, apparently. We, for one thing, since we had an organization, there wasn't like, you know, we didn't pay a lot of people. Because they had jobs and contracts. Yeah, I mean, they worked somewhere. Yep. Yeah, so... Uh, and when I was in Springfield... Everything went through the speaker's office. Like, who would you saw a lobbyist? They take you out. Just like say that—that that was your whole relationship with them. Right. Well, Todd, the, the ones who I had a real personal relationship with worked for their own company. Right. Worked for a comp for a big company. So, Todd, what happens? How do we? How do we replenish our stock? Because I'm gonna tell you, I really think that the pipeline is clogged. With fakers and pretenders, you I need do. Some hungry people. Yeah, I think, but yeah. I. Well, you just can't be hungry though. You got to be smart too. Well, see, I think you got to be hungry. You got to be smart, and you got to be willing to put in the work. Like I feel like they have changed the game, and so young people now just feel like they supposed that I'm smart, mm -hmm. so I should be. I should just be at the top. Like I want to do policy, so I'm gonna do policy. No, nah, fool, you don't just do policy. You go. Did you win your precinct? See. 98% of these people can't tell you that they've ever won a precinct. Hmm. Most of the people that are political, that are quote unquote political, that run for office, they want to be part of the club. They want the, because that's your opportunity yeah. to be royalty, right? If you're not going to be economically, economic royalty, then what your goal is to get a job at the union or get a job, a cushy job at the union where you don't really have to work super hard. You get to go to all the events, you get to take all the pictures. But you really don't have to sweat. See, I feel like everybody is putting their time in building the white guy's place. And really the only job for black folks over there is to check the Negroes. Hmm. No, seriously. Check the Negroes or at least be like, you know I got your back. Yeah. Ty, Way back. I mean, how do you... How, how, how do you establish, how do you determine if somebody is politically credible when you talk to them? Because I, I got a problem when I be talking to people, arguing with them, and then I be like, like, why do I don't even respect your opinion politically? Because, like, literally, you're really talking about all hypotheses. You have not, Todd, I was thinking about the time when we had, I was in the 18th Ward, and we were against the mayor's office, and the mayor had put the whole aviation department and the whole water department against us. Yeah. They were 10 people to a precinct. Yeah. I remember people being outside in the cold. Leon Rogers will tell you that even when he worked for me as an intern, uh -huh. who's now the big personality, I would have him outside putting signs in the frozen ground with a drill, uh -huh. right? Coming up with innovations politically to... To go, my man Keith Harris puts it like this: If you're as black and you got all the tools in the toolbox to build a house, then you don't that house don't count. Mm -hmm. But it's when you got only a hammer and nails and you can put it together, that's when you got some political acumen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how do you determine who you respect politically, Todd? Like, not, I'm not saying like they can't have an opinion, but like where you take their political opinion seriously. Well. Usually it's got something to do uh, with some experience, uh, having been some places and, and done some things. Uh, that's, and if it's true political advice, you know, it's somebody who, who was with somebody who seemed to have some sense. You know, generally people who, who deal with people who are just running all the time, eh, and I'm not certain if I'm really going to trust. Right. <laughs> trust like, so much. in Chicago, it's like, in some cases, people feel like I almost feel like people feel like because of their associations, no work. Like I, I, I guess I am having a problem right now because I feel like the loudest voices in our community and the voices that get the most opportunity to be political mislead people, or they're inexperienced. Yeah, I'm with that. It's like the people that have the even, and it's like people don't know how to, again, never argue with fools from a distance because giants don't argue with midgets because people from a distance can't tell the difference. Right. And so what I found myself doing sometimes is arguing with people who've never won anything. Anything. 
right. right? They got all these policies and hypotheticals, and they are pundits and they can analyze, but they've never won anything. Yeah, a lot of them have never been in the race. Oh, right. And then the ones that never win Testament. still win. Cause as long as you as long as you're not gonna be over there and be too powerful, or if they think you got potential, then what they wanna do is get you fat so that you don't become a warrior. Right? Well I what I I don't I, what I see a lot of is I I don't see enough people who want to be powerful in their space. They want to I guess like I say they want to belong to something else. And I'm like, you can't belong to something else until you are the king or queen of your own space. Well, you can belong to something else, oh, yeah. but you become a rook. Right, right. Right? Or right, you're a rook. And it's like no matter how special you feel, then white folks can always be like, nope, yeah. nope, nope, nope. Because I'm going to tell you, when the black people come, like when the unions call and stuff like that, and the black people come, I'll be like, yeah, okay. What did, what did Flynn say? Mm -hmm. What did such and such say? Because honestly, your job is to deliver the check. Right. They cut the check. They decide the check. And I feel like we need to be powerful enough like, I, I feel like I want us to be powerful enough that instead of SEIU or somebody coming into the black neighborhood and telling us they finna take our spot, mm -hmm. right, that we say, no, you're not going to take our spot. We're going to have our own and don't come over here because we got the political strength to check you on the other side, right? Because, again, the, the those unions can come into our neighborhoods. And let me be clear, because I think the SEIUs took the, the poor black neighborhoods. The, yes. And and said we'll organize the poor black people because at fifteen dollars an hour, it we, it's a lot of them. Right. On the north side and in the west in the suburbs, the skilled trade unions are kind of the most powerful forces in those neighborhoods. And it's like they walk around threatening black elected officials, saying get down and lay down. And we really have no choice. And the people that we have that are supposed to be our political warriors, they just say let's lay down. Because guess what? They're domestic. They've been domesticated. They just want to be patted, petted, and rubbed, and fed instead of going out and hunting. They, they, yeah, they're, they know they're in the house. They know there's going to be some food and water. It's like my cat. <laughs> like, he'll go out, but hey, when I pull back up, he runs out and says, Come on, Ty, let's go back in the house. Here, yeah, pussy, pussy, pussy. Here, yeah, pussy, pussy, I don't pussy. Have to say that. He cat. Just oh, he yeah. just follows you. <laughs> well, we'll talk about it all. We're going to wrap this thing up when we come back. More of The Morning Show with Mae Jackson coming up on The Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON. This is Pam Morris Walton, your gospel sister. Join me each and every Sunday at 11 a.m. for Gospel with Pam Morris Walton. Be inspired, be blessed on 1690 a.m. WVON. That's God's favorite radio station. See you there. Oh, yeah! You can't grow your money under your mattress, so stop it. Oh. Todd, talk to Damn. people, man. Conflicted. Conflicted maze. Conflicted <laughs> with making great radio because, you know, we have to be responsible. But at the same time, it sure would be fun to have Reverend Jackson comment on the coronavirus. Minister Jackson. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sinners and heathens causing the end of the world. You know, when I was, uh, when I get blocked by Facebook, when I was working, well, not even working, when I was, when my dad was a committeeman, day four and all that stuff, every once in a while somebody would say something about the mayor or something like, we gotta, you know, what, the mayor's gonna be mad. And I'd be like, we don't work for the mayor. The mayor's not our leader. Our leader is... Every, no, that's what you thought. <laughs> that's not what they thought. Yeah. I'm they like, thought your power was granted instead of taken. That's exactly right. They, like... And that's the problem. Like, everybody is, is playing to get... Grant. Everybody is playing for the appointment. No one is planning for the, the spot. Like, put the game plan together to take the whole shit. Don't say, can I get it? Jamaica? <laughs> really? 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ty, these things need to get tightened up again. What is that? The tighten up. The the microphone adjusters. I mean the volume controls. Ty's is a work is fakey. This oh, one's fakey too. Oh, that one's The input. What's going on with this mic? Request isn't to get it fixed, man. That bad boy will be sitting there for a minute. Ain't nothing happening. Same with the headphones. I feel like the headphones is just a matter of going underneath there and tightening it up, though. Yeah, we, what we ended up doing was swapping WRLLs out. Sonya, oh, you gave me your camera back? It died? I exited out by accident. Okay. So what we did to fix them last time was... Take the piece from the other side. Yep. Now we have no more pieces left. And then we're offline, right? Are we still on? No, we're still on. for the rest of my life. <laughs> it's not that nice of a house. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm the great pretender. Woo! -woo. I'm doing well. Woo! These are such dances. Too much. Oh, I'm left. You are tuned in to Top Chicago 1690 AM. I'm your host, Maze Jackson. Got my co-host, Ty Stroger, and I have the Sonia, greatest musical know, conductor ever. Sonia, you know, if we go like uh, usual, Maze will say, why are you playing these white folks? <laughs> uh, uh, the great pretenders. We, it's like the great pretenders. Uh, hey. It's the great <laughs> pretenders. We have got to figure out where we go. Ty, power is the ability to make people do something that they want that they don't want to do against their will right and so i like to think of it as power is the ability to make people want to do something that you want them to do okay i'll take that unfortunately we have people who think that what they want to do is be they just want to jump in the lap get rubbed and petted get fed real well yeah. but aren't really interested in the battle it's like, it reminds me of the people that didn't want to leave Israel, right? They was like, what you talking about? It's nice and warm in here. They only beat us three times a day. <laughs> and shoot, the way I'm at now, I don't get no beatings. Mm -hmm. I just come out here and tell y'all. Mm -hmm. Todd, how do we replenish the field? Like, how do, we, how do we restock our game? And the reason I ask that is because I believe that over the course of time, we have been rewarded. Many of us have been rewarded for failure. It's like the participation trophies. Everybody I know loses gets a win anyway, mm -hmm. right? So there's no hunger to get back out and fight. There's no hunger to sharpen your sword. You like, shoot, what I need this sword for? I'm eating good, I ain't got to hunt no more. It was worth it all. How do we get from being fat and lazy as it relates to our political gamesmanship. I think you've got it right. 
you, you have a group whose plan is is to get into positions that will make them powerful to be able to make things happen. The challenge becomes, Todd. But see, that will make the other people have to work too. But the challenge becomes, Todd, is that oftentimes the white folks, when they see you got good people, uh-huh. They then say, ooh, we do not want that person to turn into a warrior, so let's make them fat and lazy. Oh, yeah. Right? They be like, ooh, Maze. Ooh, is Maze got somebody over there? Let me let, 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 let me get him a job. Money's the great equalizer. No, it's no, it's the great. It, for us, no, it's. It's equalizer. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not an equalizer for black folks because, again, we're not the source of our own income. Right. We're not the source of our own power. Your power comes from. You keeping black people subjected to white leadership so you can eat. As compared to white black folks saying, I'm going to make the decisions. You're going to have to abide by them because we got the relationships and we still eat. You know how many um, appointments the mayor makes? A lot. That's all I can say too. And it's an awful lot. No, it's not. It's an awful lot. Right. The governor makes a lot of of appointments and and their influence is incredible. But you know what? The uh, you know how the governor and the mayor make appointments, yeah. based on people that can help them or hurt them. Yeah. Right. And when the mayor takes, uh, when the mayor or the governor is taking, rec- they don't just pull it out of their butt. Right. They say, "Ooh, I'm gonna pick this person because they could help me, but better yet, if they're not on the team, they could hurt me." That's how it works for white folks, right? So when when the governor gets elected, he gets a phone call from a bunch of people who say, look, I need this, 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 and this. I need my guy here, 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 and here. And you know how he decides on whether he's going to honor that? How? how you can help him or how you can hurt him. They start to do a power analysis. Right now, there is nobody black that has enough power independently outside of the system because I think there's some black folks that can individually. But collectively, we're not in a position to make a demand to the governor. So all of the people that the governor picks are not going to be loyal to the black community. Who are they going to be loyal to? The governor. The governor. See, and, and again, it goes back to my point. We should tell the governor who the black person is that represents black people in his office. Not him telling us that this person, because that person is going to really then tell you what he wants the governor to say and we don't have what the governor wants and he feels his job is not to be loyal to the black community but to be loyal to the white guys and deliver messages it's the same thing that happens at the unions it's the same thing that happens at the democratic party Mm -hmm. our pipeline of free thinking strong independent building a black political infrastructure that's not in the political pipeline right now not in the traditional there's not people with organizations outside that they are in, you know, like a lot of people when they get into the into politics, they're always looking out for their organization. Right. How can we get more of our people? See, I, when you come to what's in it for the black people, we ain't about no kumbaya. Oh, we gonna be rah rah. It's like we are about the collection of power. Cause let me tell you what, we can pass legislation with power. Yes. Right. Usually the black folks that they got are telling you why what you want to happen can't happen. Instead of telling you why. When I talk to the white guys, you know what they say? When I tell the white boys about the what's in it for the black people bill, they was like, that's a pretty good idea. Can you get any black people to do it? Because we would get on board. That's why we found Cam Buckner. That's why we got people like Jahan Gordon and Art Turner and LaShawn Ford. But Todd, I'm going to tell you. You know, actually, I found that to be true, too, that... Uh, when you bring things up like that up, they're like, oh, that's not a bad idea. And sometimes they're like, hmm, and that might be able to help some people I know over here. The challenge is black folks that we got in power have been de- in, in, not in power, in place. So there's a difference between in power and in place. Most of the people that are in place are domesticated. When I was in the chairman of labor, I was in place because the whole committee <laughs> ran through the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, are we in power? Or are we in place? Do the black people we have that are in the perception of power, they have the perception, but are they really in power or are they in place? I think we saw that 
power displayed in a few state rep races or lack thereof. And I guess I got to ask the question, what's in it for the black people? Mm -hmm. Are you in it for the black people? Did you benefit from your job because we asked what's in it for the black people? I could tell you, yes, because your boss told me so. Hey, y'all. So, for Jennifer Thompson in the newsroom, for Miss Sonya Escobar, the news conductor, the soul playing. For my co-host, Todd Stroger, I am the host of the WVON Morning Show, asking every single day, what's in it for the black people? And if you don't like it, that's right, Diane, they are neutered. What do they call spade and, what do they call that? Spade and neutered. Spade and neutered. I am the host of the WVON Morning Show. And if you don't like it, you can still tell them, man, you said, we out of here. Peace. We got a bunch of domestic cats, politically.